Okay. All right, so we've been looking at this system of phase oscillators. Uh, and and coupling them in various geometries and asking basically a question about uh, is there some long time collective behavior that emerges and uh, this system has proved to be very rich uh, both in the amount of applications that it has uh, has relevance to uh, and also the number of papers it has allowed people to write um, and that number keeps increasing all the time right so uh, there are many directions in which this research goes right so the first is that um, the, the property of collective synchronization that is if you have a large bunch of such oscillators uh, you know represent them in some way um, uh, and you can ask many questions so the first and simplest question that was posed by Kuramoto and company was what happens when every oscillator is connected to every other oscillator all right so you just add put some coupling strength some n and you some you ask them to interact with all n oscillators uh, with some simple uh, interaction of that type okay one could also be a little more general and allow a certain phase difference between this interaction um, recalling that oops phi and theta are interchangeably to be used all right so um, I mean just to give you an idea of the kinds of things that people have looked at partly to tell you where to look or partly to tell you to look all right uh, recall that phi is a function of t all the phi's are functions of t so the question over here is is the interaction at the same time or is it at a delayed time okay so time delay is a very important characteristic uh, that people have looked at I mean meaning that you you're thinking of signals that are moving from one one such phase oscillator to another uh, because if this is going to be a let's say it's going to be a firefly um, they communicate with each other through light signals which travel instantaneously but the neurons in the little flies brain may take some processing time so it could not it, no it need not be just the signal at, at a given time it could be a signal at a delayed time All right so that is one one particular aspect the second and more common thing that people have done is to ask what happens if these are connected on some kinds of networks okay again thinking of the uh, fireflies on the tree uh, a firefly of course it's you know in principle if it could see every other firefly it is glo globally coupled but the leaves may obscure some uh, and sort of I'm making up a situation as I go along all right so the connectivity may be slightly different so let me put in an adjacency matrix over there that a j i is equal to one if oscillator i and j are communicating and it's zero if they are not all right uh, it need not be it could be symmetric it need not be symmetric uh, okay given this adjacency matrix one of course has a graph so the question that one could ask is what kind of a graph is it is it for example um, you know maybe a linear it, maybe it's something with loops maybe it's something without loops maybe it's a Bethe lattice maybe it's a hierarchical lattice maybe it's a um, I mean you name it people have considered all these things 
all right? If not all these things, certainly the question has been asked that if instead of communicating all to all, I have partial communications, then what happens, all right? Uh, a particularly rich kind of uh, 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 sort of communication network that has been looked at is where you have two communities and with an occasional link between them. So you have communities which are interacting very strongly with one another. And then between the communities, there's a very weak or very occasional links. Such graphs are interesting for their graph theoretic properties. All right? Um, I mean, since you're from a StatMec background, you can immediately ask, supposing I have a lattice, uh, what is the difference when the adjacency matrix corresponds to a percolating case versus a non-percolating case, right? Because you've got connectivity throughout the system. You've got an infinitely large cluster in one case, and you don't have, you only have finite clusters in another case. So that would be an interesting question to ask. Um, I, I hope you get the idea. One can go on and on with these kinds of variations on a theme. Uh, but one of the, uh, um, there are one or two really exciting things that have been happening in this business in the last few years. And I will uh, talk about them. But first, let me just complete what we were doing yesterday. Uh, <coughs> right, I'll tell you the plan for today. Yesterday, uh, we essentially uh, had a, a sort of a full introduction to the Kuramoto problem, right? Kuramoto, where this was without that creature there, where all the A's were one, and we were just looking at that. And we had uh, the uh, complex order parameter, and this was just the average of all the phases. Okay. And this was the quantity that we were looking at. And what we saw was that R, the real part of this order parameter, was able to check out the degree of coherence between all the oscillators. Because if they were incoherent, if all these phases were randomly distributed on the circle, R would be 0. So R measured the extent to which they were uh, <coughs> together. and Psi was telling you what the average value of that phase was, right? OK. And we saw also that the way in which this uh, process uh, uh, occurred uh, is a good example of emergence. What, you know, in complex systems, the behavior is something that emerges as you keep adding, uh, you know, more elements and increasing the coupling. We saw that for some parts, you know, given the fact that this, uh, the frequencies had a spread, um, for any given k, a few of them could become coherent, right? Because omega by kr was less than 1. And as you kept increasing k, more and more of the omegas were coming in, OK? So each oscillator was actually sensitive to the presence of all the other oscillators. In, in the global case. In these cases, things are a little more complicated, as you can imagine. Uh, the time delay, is, uh, time delay is another huge complexity, because once you have time delay, uh, you need the entire histories. So what was a finite dimensional, I mean, even if n was large, uh, if a finite dimensional, a finite set of coupled first order equations, once you have time delay, it just goes to an infinite, essentially partial differential equation of some kind. Okay. So where I left off yesterday was uh, to get an expression for the real part of the order parameter. And this was just given as the integral from uh, 
times e to the i. Okay, so this was the particular integral. And rho itself had two parts. One part was a delta function, uh, which was well, i minus i minus right? And the other part was basically some constant divided by um, uh, omega minus kr. Let's try to get that. Modulus of that. So this was the, the clustered oscillators, the ones that were sensitive to K, and they were coming together. This was the ones that were incoherently moving around in the circle. Okay, And whenever this denominator took a small value, it could never go to 0 because k was not large enough for that. Right? Whenever it would slow down, speed up, etc., it was just some average smeared out background, which in the integral would give 0. So finally, you only had this uh, contribution to worry about. And that integral, uh, once I put in that delta function over there, that basically gave me uh, integral over omega less than kr in magnitude cosine of sine inverse omega by kr g of omega d omega. And that integral uh, can be done. And it basically comes out to say that r was equal to kr integral minus pi by 2 to pi by 2 cosine squared phi times g of kr sine phi d phi. Yeah. I know, but then the minus pi to plus pi, actually the, the ones that will solve the uh, sign equality will just bring you to minus pi by 2 to pi by 2. Okay. See, remember we have that condition. We had the delta function, right? And you had to only take those parts of cosine which were positive. That branch was there. Right. Anyway, so that's, that is the uh, integral. And this obviously has a solution, r is equal to 0. And r is equal to 0 is an incoherent solution that continues to be a solution of this equation. Right. And for many cases, or we will typically consider those cases for which g has a Taylor expansion. OK, so the derivatives, at least at the maximum, the derivatives and the second derivatives, et cetera, are all good. All right? So uh, since this is an even, the integral itself has to be even. Right? So basically, g, I will write it as g0 plus kr sine phi squared g double prime of 0 plus all higher order terms is a factor of 2. Right? OK. So taking the first term gives me that a 1 is equal to k times the integral of minus pi by 2 to pi by 2 d phi of cosine squared phi. times g0 
and this immediately tells you that the critical value k sub c is just equal to 2 over pi times g of That integral is just pi by 2, and then flip it around. Hmm. Okay, and this is Kuramoto's celebrated result. And if you put, put in the Lorentz distribution, you'll get a value that the transition happens at a value of k equals 2, or something like that. No. So you see, there's a function of k. Here is r. r is equal to 0 is always a solution, right? And this solution will only occur above kc. And th this particular de uh, you know, dependence, you work it out with the next term. Right, and it, this one, in the case of the, I mean, in general, it looks like this. It's a continuous transition, starting at k sub c. All right, so this is frequently described as a supercritical transition arising out of the r is equal to zero solution. The next term actually gives you that r is equal to, um, what is it, under root, this is something that you all should be able to work out, k minus kc over pi times kc to the fourth g double prime of zero. That is, you, yeah, taking the next term, doing the integral just gives you that, all right? So in the case of the Lorentzian, Kc is equal to 2, right? And um, the uh, other dependence is 1 minus k over Kc under root. So it goes up as a square root of k. Which one? Uh, the second step where 1 equals g, uh, yes, yes. This one? Yes, sir. Uh, so we can't cancel the r's because r is equal to, to zero, leading right? order, leading order. You don't cancel r, so I'm just taking the zeroth value over here. Right. See, I'm writing this as an integral is fine. Yes. I'm just removing that, and 1 is equal to that. Uh, yes, sir. but we are putting r equals 0, right? Uh, so here... The, the Taylor expansion, the first term is R less. Yes. The second term has R. Okay. Uh, right. Okay, sir. Hmm? Big one? K is always positive. K is always If the second derivative over here is negative, then all this is true. If it is not negative, then we have problems. You have to worry about that. That's also why, you know, yesterday Abhishek had uh, asked what happens if you have all the omegas the same. For the delta function case, you know, this doesn't quite work. But for the, you know, normal Lorentzian and standard kinds of things, this does work. Yeah? But it's not always possible to, to do this, but at least in one case, because it is done, now we know the connection between the phase transition and the synchronization transition. That's all. No. No. I mean, there, there are, uh, see, the infinite, uh, if all of them are the same, 
if all the omegas are the same, if it's a delta function transition, that problem actually turns out to be completely integrable. Okay, so you have solitons in those kinds of systems. Um, like I said, you know, the people have worried about all sorts of things. This one? See, some of these details are really not important, meaning that what I would like you to appreciate from this is that here we have a system where in the limit of large numbers of oscillators, there will actually be a transition from an incoherent state to a coherent state. Right? And this coherent state will have a finite value of this order parameter r, right? And as k goes to very large values, uh, that value of r will go to 1. So you do have this so-called synchronization transition. Okay. Okay. Now, I, I want to briefly mention a very important development, uh, sort of both from chaos or from the study of dynamics to the study of uh, this transition. And this is a uh, development over the years. OK, so you know, people would, one can not, uh, one can be a little upset about the fact that, OK, you've got yet another geometry, put in Kuramoto oscillators. You would, once you're tired of ne nearest neighbor couplings, add next nearest neighbor couplings. Once you're tired of uh, you know, first order differential equations, you say, well, I add inertia, I will do this, that, and the other. Meaning variations in the theme can only be explored so much. So a very general approach to examining a whole bunch of such questions was uh, suggested by Ott and Antonsen, OK? And this is in a paper in 2008. I've given it to you in your reading materials uh, over there. It is a way of thinking about Kuramoto or, I mean, thinking about these kinds of problems in general. All right? And it's proved to be, again, remarkably um, uh, sort of fertile as a way of looking at these systems because you can actually, you can make some kind of progress. So where Ott and Antonsen start out is, um, you know, re recall that we have d phi by dt is equal to omega i minus k over n summation over j sine OK, so one writes for this, this one particle density, if you think of just rho of phi, omega, and t, d rho by dt is minus d by d phi of omega plus f of phi, um, f of phi rho. Okay. The arguments, etc., over there, where f is equal to k integral over d omega integral over d phi g of omega sine of phi prime minus phi rho of phi prime omega t. Which I can now, putting that in over here and using this order parameter r bar, is 
this is the complex order parameter is r e to the i psi, and that's equal to just the integral over d omega, the integral over d phi, uh, e to the i phi g of omega rho of omega, sorry, rho of phi omega t. Okay. Okay, so I'm going to use this. Okay, I'll tell you roughly what the plan is as follows. Taking the exponential representation of sine, using this particular quantity over there, and adding it in over here, gives me the following equation, minus d by d phi times omega plus k over 2i and r gets added in over there. This is r bar e to the i phi negative minus r bar star e to the i phi rho of phi omega t. It's just a little careful manipulation of, see the sine becomes the one over two i of that. The e to the i goes in over there. And I think I worked it out carefully enough. Uh, again, the important part is the conceptual one, which is the very next step. What Ott and Antonsen had realized by the time this work came around was that phi, after all, is an angle. So all these functions are periodic in these angles. So why not make a Fourier transform? So rho of phi omega t, let me write it as 1 over 2 pi summation of n going from minus infinity to infinity of the Fourier coefficients rho n of omega t e to the i, e to the i n phi. Okay? Just a straight, I mean, so far nothing else has been done except to re rewrite rho in terms of its Fourier components. Now I can take the time derivative over here, and I can take the uh, phi derivative over there to get the following equations, the following sets of equations. For the Fourier components over here, that Okay, just simple taking of derivatives here and there and equating all the terms of uh, the same phase. Okay, n is going from minus infinity to infinity in this particular case, right? So you've just replaced one integral equation by uh, the Fourier transform. What Ott and Antonsen then did was to propose an ansatz. And this ansatz is based on experience, uh, not the personal experience itself, although that's undoubtedly what goes into it, but the experience that in many, many cases, the Fourier components, rho twiddle n, 
could be written as some number alpha to the power n. R tilde is the complex order parameter. And just for, you know, from here you can see that R twiddle is just equal to the integral over d omega. You can see it's just the, the first component. G of omega R, uh, sorry, rho twiddle one star. Just the n is equal to one component. So if I now take this as an ansatz, remember that these are all functions of omega and t. All right? So this is a basically the nth Fourier component is alpha to the n, where alpha is clearly less than one, otherwise things would diverge. All right? So this is the heart of this ot Antonsen ansatz. Uh, there's actually nothing more to it. But what this does is to immediately make the problem very accessible because now um, well, I mean, now you can see that all the derivatives just sort of all, I mean, everything just comes right out because it's only derivatives of alpha. So now I've got partial of alpha with respect to time plus i omega alpha plus k by 2 of r twiddle alpha squared minus r twiddle star is equal to 0. All the infinite equations has just come down to the solution of one equation. OK? And I'm not going to solve this, obviously, because this now depends, you know, this depends on what is r. What is r depends on what is your g of omega, what is your rho, you know, what is the problem, actually, that you're looking at. But what they showed was that in a large class of problems, you can actually solve this quite nicely. And you'll see, you'll see the Lorentz case in, I mean, then there's more to it, okay? You've got that simple differential equation there. Because finally, you really want R out of all this, okay? So this gives you, you see, you've reduced your infinite dimensional problem to the solution of one. And from a conceptual point of view, you see that the whole problem of synchronization is that you've got an infinite set of things that are oscillating crazily, or at least differently. And once you go to the synchronization, it is just as if you are a single species. OK? So depending on your particular specific problem, you, you know, your solutions will have to have a certain form, your alphas will be particular, et cetera, et cetera. But in a large number of cases, this turns out to be a very good answer. Okay? Uh, not just in the case of global all-to-all -all coupling, also in the cases of you know, communities, also in the cases of hierarchical lattices, and so on and so forth. It turns out to be an amazingly good answer. Right? So anyway, this is something that one should know of, that uh, by going into Fourier space and making this approximation, this actually helps you to solve a lot of problems. OK, um, yeah. Um, so for the Kuromoto itself, or for the Kuromoto type of problems itself, um, I, you know, I think by now, I really have covered all the various parts of it. 
meaning we've looked at the static oscillators, we've looked at the all-to-all -all coupling, we've seen the phase transition, we've seen different ways of approaching the phase transition, in particular this powerful ansatz, and there seems to be only one thing left to do, so let's do that. And the thing that's left to do is to try to marry um, active material to the idea of uh, moving oscillators. Okay, so so you have swarms, and I presume it's a topic of some interest over here. How do groups of agents that are moving around in two or three dimensional space, how do they swarm? And most of the time when people are looking at active matter, I mean, not I shouldn't say most of the time, uh, there, are, there are various levels at which you can look at active matter. Uh, one is to just have internal sources of energy that shall not be named, providing the energy. But one could also have a set of swarming oscillators. And the first thing that you do in trying to solve this problem is to remove all that and put an A there and call them swarmulators. Okay, so um, I'm not a fan of that name. <laughs> Nevertheless, this is a thing. Okay. Uh, now, if I, I mean, let me take the constructive approach. How does one, how does one dream up of a problem like this? Supposing I wanted to, I, I wanted to talk about oscillators that were able to move around in space. Right. What would they tend to do? We know now that. An oscillator is just basically pi dot is omega i, right? And if it can interact with other oscillators, it's going to do that, right? But now if, if you've got a, a small proportion of oscillators inside the space, one can imagine that the interaction between them is uh, of, of course, it's of this type k over something. And let me. It's going to interact with. Uh, I don't know what to put over there. Let's say sine of uh, theta, or sorry, phi uh, i minus phi j, right? But. In imagining the problem, okay, I'm just trying to motivate how would one think about it, okay, even if it's not completely correct, uh, how would one think about such a problem? This interaction has to be modulated by something. And that something is, you know, how far away these uh, species i and j are, right? So let's say that I put something which is a distance between them, right? Where x is a coordinate in two or three dimensional space, it doesn't matter. Yeah? But these are not static elements, they are mobile. So that tells us that xi dot, this has got to be, okay, is the velocity. So these are moving around in space at some velocity, but swarms, what happens to swarms? When these agents come close to one another, they have two competing features. One is that these particles or these agents would like to aggregate. Right? That's what you see in, in studies of active matter and flocking and stuff like that, right? You've got species that move, uh, come close by, and the moment, I'll just come, okay, and the moment they come within a range of interference or a range of uh, discovery of each other, they realign themselves and start moving together. Yeah? Uh, 
we're going to, we're we just going to, you know, we're going to put in all this time. I mean, if you have to invent a problem. I mean, uh, once like we have considered the dynamicity, then the oscillators are no more like, uh, uh, I don't know, are they statically coupled or they should be? Okay, so what I'm, what I'm asking you to think about is that I've got an agent or, see, because there are now both two kinds of variables. There are internal freedoms, the phi's, and there are spatial coordinates, x1, x, y, z, whatever it is that you want, all right? So in the simplest example, I mean, you're at a, already at another level, but in the simplest case, let me say that the phi's interact with other phi's, the x's interact with other x's, right? So the swarmulators <coughs> are, <coughs> of course, they're groups of swarming oscillators, but the swarminess is separate from the oscilliness. Okay, so it doesn't have to be. I mean, I can see, obviously, now the level of interaction is already modulated by a distance, right? And the swarminess over here tells you basically that uh, I can have an interaction with uh, all other particles. And these particles are going to have some attraction, at some attraction terms, and then some repulsion terms, right? So I can think of the attraction. I mean, I can now put in any, any kind of dependence that I want. I can put 1 upon r to the 12th for the attraction and 1 upon r to the 6th. I can have, you know, Leonard Jonesium particles. I could have Coulombic interactions. I could have any old thing. Okay, what I'm just saying is that you can now take this whole paradigm of synchronization to the case where these oscillators are moving in physical three-dimensional space, right? And in 2017, Strogatz and his group, they came up with the following model of swarmulators. So let's just. This is an area where really active matter, stat mech, and oscillator dynamics just comes together. Hence, you know, I mean, th there is also very few, I mean, there's enough work done on this, but not, not in the category of Kuramoto. All right, so I've got xi dot is vi, simple velocity, plus some interaction, some terms which is attractive, as I said, which depends on xi and xj, all right? And one can also imagine that Orientation, I mean, supposing you were thinking of, you know, magnetic particles that are moving around. Okay, the spins will matter. And so I take, the, take that as a paradigm and just say that I, let me have something that depends on phi i and phi j. Okay, so the degree of attractiveness will depend also on the internal states of the particles that are being attractive attracted, and you can have a repulsion term which will also, which will also depend on xi and xj. See, in the simplest case, this could just be hardcore repulsion. You don't come closer than so much. Yeah, meaning this is a fertile area for you all to think about. Okay, hence the, uh, thing. all right, so here is your Swarm dynamics. Okay, and you can see how this I is going to be. So I could be something like xi minus xj or xj minus xi divided by the distance. 
So the further off they are, it really doesn't matter. There's no attraction. It just goes off. And the repulsion could be a little stronger term. So uh, what have they? They've got xj minus xi divided by xi minus xj uh, squared or cubed or whatever it is, you know. You have a, right? So you have this hard, make it 12 if you like. Yeah? Um, I'm just, I'm just taking all the angular dependence and putting it over here. I mean, I, this is how they did it. I mean, it, it doesn't have to, it doesn't have to be that way. All right. I'm, I, I, I'm just motiv Okay. So my basic motivation is that the swarminess depends on distance, depends on physical distance. And the closer things are, you can you need not even have a you need not even have a internal freedom dependence in the attractive part, right? But then that will not distinguish between different states of the system. Uh, their initial work did not even have an orientational problem in it, right? So the usual flocking type of work that uh, Vicek, et etc., Vicek models that kind of orientation was not even there. This is not difficult to do, all right? Okay. Yeah? That is just their model for it, I say. It doesn't have to be that way. See, I mean, we typically we think that between two particles, the forces are going to be proportional to the separation between them. Yes. That's all. You can you can put in any kind of potentials you like over there. So now I was like wondering why uh, this square comes in in the. And you see, you need different powers for attraction and repulsion, right? Okay. Otherwise, you just subtract one from the other and be done with it. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So that's why I said you know if you think of Leonard Jonesium, you can think of twelve and versus six if you like. Little louder, please. So this is a case of distance-dependent interactions. <laughs> Put in noise. Go ahead. I mean, I'm not talking about a Gaya Guzra field. All right, the first paper in all this business only started in 2017. All right, so. Put in noise, put in pink noise, put in purple noise, I don't know, you know, put in violence. You know, so as far as I'm concerned, all bets are off. Please, you know, and it's up to you to think about uh, variations. Chances are somebody would have addressed at least some of those questions. All right? Also, is there any uh, biological motivation for this kind of a... Uh Always, always biological motivation. And people who know least about the biology are usually telling you the Japanese tree frogs are all synchronizing like this, and sperm cells are moving in uh, great units. And I'm sure there is some analogy to all those things. But, um, you know, I mean. I mean, oscillatory movement is, I mean, I was trying to. Deliver what no, I'm going to show you a slide later on which will tell you where the oscillations and the spatial interactions do play a role. Okay. So, uh, so you're assuming that at large distances the repulsion falls. Uh, Everything falls off. So it attracts at large distances because they're very short. Yeah. Okay. And the idea is that the sign of f is always negative. So the signs will adjust themselves to be right. Okay. But if I if f changes sign, the first term will also change character from attractive to repulsive, right? Well, it, it depends on what kind of interaction. See, the uh, the example that these people did in their first work was to put in one plus j cosine of phi j minus phi i. And j is less than one. Yeah. Then it's always positive. Then it looks like repulsive. So do you, do you need x j minus x i or? Which one? Uh, well, maybe I mean okay. xj minus xi. What I'm saying, the signs will adjust themselves to be physically correct. All right? 
for me, the more important thing was this, all right? And the fact that you could have a orientation dependent, you know, the degree of attractiveness would be uh, you know, dependent on the internal variables, all right? Now, it depends on what the internal variables are. If it is going to be something like a simple angle, it's a Kuromoto angle, then I would like this to be true. So what, in fact, they had done was exactly this, that you have a sine i minus j, but then it gets just modulated by that distance. So the further off you are, the less important it is. Um, and maybe they just had k over n and all that, and they looked over all particles, all right? Uh, but, one, you know, in contrast to the usual swarming models of uh, a la Vecek, et cetera, where you have a finite sphere of vision, uh, where, you know, the bird, so to speak, only looks at its seven nearest neighbors or ten nearest neighbors, here you can, in, these are all non-conservative models, so it doesn't even matter what you do. Anyhow, okay, I'm not going to describe this work. It's a famous paper, Nature Physics or Nature something. Just, no, it's nature, uh, <laughs> right? But you can imagine now what kinds of emergent phenomena come through. Because by tweaking these various quantities, you actually don't have the simple two-phase problem that we had in uh, the case of uh, Kuramoto. In Kuramoto, you were either async or sync depending on the value of k. Here, you depend on density, the number of the, you know, how, how many objects there are in a certain amount of space, because that tells you over what lengths you're going to get correlations and so on. The next thing that's important is, of course, k. And then a lot of choice as to what you put for your attraction, repulsion, so on and so forth. So there are actually some five, six phases that you can discover in such systems. And in fact, in the first work, they discovered five or six phases, right? Where the internal variable was just an angle. The internal variable could be a spin, in which case you could have a floating Ising model or a swarming Ising model. Then we just, you know, meaning I, I don't even know whether that has been done or not done and whether there's interest or not interest or what have you, but I'm just suggesting that these are all things that one could be looking at. Okay? Uh, yeah. So uh, this model, can it be into the terms of Mahler's and Firefly's coming to, like, um, See, the Malaysian Fireflies is, uh, they're static. You know, they're all sitting at a particular spot and saying, I'm open, I'm open, I'm open, that sort of a thing, right? So they're not actually moving around. Uh, this, the, uh, you know, the motivation paragraphs, uh, you know how to write a paper, right? By, or you, you know how papers are written. The following problem has been of great interest for the last 95 years, yet we are doing something incredibly new and incredibly different. This applies to Malaysian tree frogs, uh, you know, wandering crickets, groups of spermatozoa, and cells, and this and that and the other. I mean, I'm, I'm not being cynical, but I'm telling you this is how you, you know, just fall in line. These are the things one says. So Japanese tree frogs apparently, you know, they jump and jump and croak. I don't know what they do. <laughs> they do stuff like that. And obviously they have got, they fight for territory, so they can't come too close to one another and far away. Forgetting all that, mathematically it's an interesting problem, <laughs> all right? But I, I mean, this, this does have applications. Um, I mean, what's the, the discovery of biology by physicists. I mean, biology was always there, but the fact that physicists discovered it in the 1990s or thereabouts, okay? After that, wherever you look, whatever you're doing seems to be most relevant to biology. It's not relevant to biologists, but <laughs> not you. <laughs> yeah. 
since uh, the order parameter uh, is uh, is like a uh, center of mass yeah. kind of a thing. So if I associate uh, radius with each of the oscillator, so now they can uh, come inside the circle also. So that is also kind of a somalator, is that? See, the order parameter has to become more complicated for this because you'll have both internal and external uh, spatial variables to put in. Like radius. I forget now precisely what they did, but it's not just e to the i phi summation. Uh, you have to also worry about how many particles there are close by and so on and so forth. You remember that the original, uh, the Kuramoto order parameter is just r times e to the i, um, sorry, r times e to the i psi, which was just a summation over the phases, right? But now it will actually depend on how clumped, you know, the, the order parameter should also judge whether there is swarming or aggregation going on, right? And, and this is just a simple phase variable, right? So there is something else that they add to it. One, one can look at the paper. No, sir, I, I, I wanted to ask in some other yeah. context uh, that uh, if I ask, so this is the order parameter w uh, with some phase, so all the oscillators are moving in this yeah. model. So now I, with that equation, the Kuramoto equation, the standard one, uh, so now I associate a radius with it. So for each oscillator, now there is a one uh, radius with it. Mm -hmm. So now they can come inside and, and then if I see them, uh, so, so now I will see uh, all the oscillators maybe moving together or moving away from each other, maybe uh, anti-clockwise or clockwise. Right. Uh, so are they also, uh, can, can we call that also swamily? That will also go in as a component of the order parameter. See, there are two orders over here. There is an order of the internal phase variable, and then there is an ordering of the particles themselves, how close they are together, because that's what swarming is all about, right? You have them all separated at the beginning, and then when they come together, they form a swarm. That is to say that there is a coherence with which they are operating. Yeah? Right. So, so I, I mean, do we call them then uh, swamilators, or, or we don't? I mean, I say it again. Uh, so do we call them uh, somalators or we don't call them somalators? We may not have called them anything till now, meaning this is a new field. So I don't, I don't precisely know. I'm just introducing you to the area of study of swarming oscillators or swarming dynamical systems, okay. all right? Or swarming spins or swarming anything, right? Just this connection between the internal and the external variables. Because the external variables are just three, because they're in three or, or two. They're either in two-dimensional space or three-dimensional space. The internal freedoms, you can have as many as you like. Yeah? Okay. okay. So that's actually a good point at which I'm going to switch gears. Uh, because one of the things that we have done so far is to only talk in terms of simple oscillators. And then we have these tantalizing things about nonlinearity, uh, what does that do, and so on and so forth. And uh, you know, the other part of STATMIC has to do with complex motion, which is ergodic, which is mixing, which is, in a sense, chaotic. So I want to now talk about uh, sync or synchrony, but also what is chaos and what is chaotic synchronization, if such a thing is, right? Okay, so I'm just going to, uh, this was promised as lecture three in the initial, uh, in the initial uh, introduction, but now let me just, see some of this I'm not going to be able to draw, not that my drawing was very good, but just wake him.
basically if you have a single internal variable like an angle phi or With a single variable, all that you can do is just sort of go around and theta dot, phi dot is just omega. But if you have more than uh, one internal variable, it turns out that especially if the interaction is nonlinear, this go on, can you? Just take time. Just take time. Yeah. <clears throat> Okay, how many of you have had an introduction to uh, ideas of chaos theory? Enough, but not enough. All right. Okay, so uh, I am not going to go too fast on this. Um, and we'll yeah, yeah, thank you. Okay, there's a lot to be said about chaos theory and so on and so forth, but let me just plunge straight into it. Chaos theory is the study of dynamical systems with typically, when written in terms of differential equations, has got three or more equations to it. Okay? There are good reasons why we don't consider less than three, because uh, a system of two coupled equations cannot and will not show chaos or anything interesting as far as this point of view is concerned. Okay? And this system was, uh, it's called the Lorenz system after Mr. Lorenz, who is uh, not he of the transformation, but uh, he of meteorology fame. Uh, he had come, Mr. Lorenz, Ed Lorenz is now no more, but uh, basically this is an approximation to the Navier-Stokes equation. Long and complicated story there, but be that as it may, Some truncation of the Navier-Stokes equation uh, leads to these three coupled uh, first-order differential equations, where x, y, and z refer to velocity fields, temperature fields, pressure fields, and so on and so forth. Okay, I'm not good. Now we just look at it from a mathematical point of view. Okay. Uh, this is almost a linear system. In fact, there's only two terms over here that explicitly make this system nonlinear. All right? And what is amazing about this system is that, um, I mean, it's first of all, that it's there. Uh, you look at it, and it's, uh, it looks, on the face of it, quite simple. Uh, Lorenz looked at a certain set of parameters where this sigma over here was 10, uh, rho was 28, and beta was 8 by 3. But much of what I'm going to say applies to all to large ranges of parameters. As you can see from this itself, there is a very, there are, there's a trivial fixed point. There's a stationary state, which is 0, 0, 0. The origin is a stationary state, because at the origin, all these three fields are, are they, they are time independent, right? But for typical values of the parameters, it turns out that that origin is unstable. And uh, instead, there are, you know, when you solve these equations, you find that there are two additional uh, stationary states, which, roughly speaking, are at the center of these two i's over here. They're also unstable. What's cool about this system is that for these val this value of the parameters, there is one stable state, and that is this object, okay? This is called the Lorenz attractor, and starting anywhere except at the fixed points, starting anywhere, you will eventually arrive at this object, okay? I mean, I, this may not be the best way to introduce you to ideas of chaos, but that at least it starts you with an idea of what's an attractor. An attractor is a state where you arrive at, to some extent, independent of initial conditions. Such a state is called an attractor, and this is the Lorentz attractor. On the Lorentz attractor, the dynamics is 
unpredictable. Namely, if you start over here with a blue pen, you trace out this blue trajectory. Uh, see, basically, this is the same picture over here. I've started somewhere over here with a blue pen, and then it just moves around in some fairly random manner, so winds around over here, then winds over here, and it, after a certain amount of time, it reaches there. Now, if I start very close by to the blue pen with a red, I go around essentially on the same object, but in the same amount of time that I reach here, I have reached over here. So an initial separation of very little in a certain amount of time, very fast as a matter of fact, it comes to a huge separation eventually. So this is the property. This is what is called chaos. This is a property which can be converted into mathematics. It's called sensitivity to initial conditions. So it basically says that if I start with an epsilon difference in two, in two points, which are epsilon close, after a certain amount of time, they become exponentially separated. And the exponential separation is, you know, so this is, at this point, the distance is epsilon, the initial epsilon, e to the lambda times time, where lambda is some positive number. OK, and that's called the Lyapunov exponent. OK, so this basically says that the separation between initial conditions goes very, very quickly. Right? OK. So, OK, I have the final. All right, so this is what is called chaos, sensitivity to initial conditions. And if, uh, you know, th this actually was sort of exposed everybody to the fact that if I have a system which is intrinsically nonlinear, any kind of time horizon over which I can predict anything is naturally exponentially small. Because the separation is growing exponentially fast, so I'm not going to be able to say anything, right? Uh, to make a point over here, I, I could, following blue and red up till here makes a lot of sense, but actually, very quickly, it doesn't make sense after that. So, you know, this, this kind of, this is an instability in time, right? But if I start from blue point over here, I come onto the attractor. If I start with the red point over here, I also come onto the same attractor. So the attractor is an object that is invariant in space. And no matter where I am, I will come on to that. Right? Yeah. Is it ergodic within the attractor? No. No, actually, you can see the, uh, oops. Uh, I mean, there, it, it's never going to go. You know, there are, there are parts of it which are going to be visited more or less. The density is highly non-uniform on it. All right? Um, yeah. I mean, there is an invariant measure that you can associate with the attractor. Right? Yeah. There could be gaps, like Saturn. <laughs> All right, so uh, this is it. Now, OK, this again was a field that started in the mid-60s, once computers or high-speed computers became uh, available, right? And uh, given the fact that there is the sensitivity to initial conditions, even though there are attractors, one could always ask the question, all right, so you see where I'm going because I have to go reasonably fast. Um, we started with things like Kuramoto. There was just an angle that was moving around. And we saw that two angles, two oscillators, there was entrainment even though you know, entrainment happened very generally, uh, not just at the same frequencies, but at a whole range of frequencies. Now I've got uh, objects on which the dynamics, and this is just you know, three dimensions. This is not even as if I've gone to some very complicated object, just three internal variables. Uh, and here I've got dynamics, which is quite complex. So the question is, what happens you know, what, what does a typical orbit look like, all right? A uh, typical orbit is like this. So I've just plotted x, you know, on, on any typical uh, in, in initial condition. I started with somewhere. 
And then x, uh, y looks very similar, z looks a little different, but the idea is not very different. So you oscillate on the left side, then on the right for a little more time, then on the left, then on the right. And you can see there is no pattern over here. It's not as if after six oscillations on the left, it will go to one on the left and then one on the right and so on. You know, this is just randomly going up and down. And, uh, and in a very fundamental sense, unpredictable, because I could start very close by and still not be able to tell what's going on. So at some point in time, people asked, supposing I have two systems that are periodic, I know that they synchronize, because Kuramoto and all others have been telling me that they synchronize. Huygens onwards. What happens if the dynamics is chaotic? Obviously, it shouldn't be able to synchronize. And many people would have just said, OK, it doesn't synchronize. Let's go and look at some other problems instead. All right? Nevertheless, uh, Fujisaka, Yamada, Pekora, Carroll, and even before Fujisaka, um, Afraimovich and others had asked this question. And they discovered something quite interesting. If I took a Lorentz system and I took the x as uh, an output of a Lorentz and I fed it into another copy of the Lorentz. So I take the x coming out of this set of equations and I put it over here. See, notice that this variable x appears here in the equation for y and the equation for z. So I have my original Lorentz. I have a copy of the Lorentz. But wherever x prime should have come, I'm just going to put in x. So I'm feeding a signal from one system into another. All right? I'm just explaining the way in which the original motivation happened. You don't have to think of it like this. But I'm just saying that supposing I just take this as, in this language, this is sometimes called the master or the drive. And this is sometimes called the slave or the response. So I take the drive and I feed in, let's say, the variable x from the drive into the response. Right? It turns out that, uh, OK, so the first thing that happens is that this becomes redundant. Because this equation is unimportant. And I now, instead of having a six-dimensional system, I have a five-dimensional system. And what is amazing is that you have synchronization. Right? So let's say the purple is the master and the green is the slave. Right? And I, there, as you can see, I, so far I've not done any coupling. Right? And th these are just independently moving around. They are chaotic, so there's no correlation between them. And you'll see also other ways of looking at this correlation between them. At this point, I say the master feeds in the signal to the slave. And then the two of them are identical after that. All right? So this was, as you can imagine, quite a surprise uh, when, when it came out. Uh, OK, it was ignored for almost 15 years. When uh, Afremovich did it, nobody looked at it. Also because it was done in uh, Soviet Union and obscure journal and so on and so forth. But then Fujisaka and Yamada did it. And anyhow, that was an obscure Asian country. Um, <laughs> no. Pekora and Carroll did it. And it was in PRL. And immediately, there was an explosion. Uh, so. Just to give you an idea of how good this synchronization is, so here is the distance between the two of those objects. And the distance between them is just varying randomly for a while. I switch on the coupling, and then boom, the distance goes to 10 to the minus whatever in no time. All right? So the synchronization is not only rapid, it's also very stable. Even though the motion itself is highly unstable. I mean, there's nothing more unstable, as an example, than chaotic motion. And here you have 
you know, stable synchronization of chaotic dynamics. Yeah? Where? Here. Random. It's also at the order of 10 to the minus 12. Computer fluctuations. Meaning it's, it's not... It's, it's not going to magically come up over there. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I did, I did all this, you know, you, I'm very trivial programmer, right? I only know Fortran, which I learned in my youth. And in, within Fortran, when in doubt, apply Euler technique, <laughs> right? I mean, I'm not going to bother with Ranga Kuta or any such thing like that. Okay, the true confessions. <laughs> okay. Now the point is that you see the process of synchronization is a process of control. We've already seen what happens in Kuramoto, right? In Kuramoto, we saw that the coupling brings together groups of oscillators that have got the right behavior. Okay, you can think about this as a control algorithm. Uh, I know we don't normally think of this as a control, but I'll show you how you think about it. So the example that I just shown you were these two Lorenz oscillators, which were like so. Uh, but instead of, see, what I can do is to say that I've got two copies of Lorenz, and then I add these extra terms over here. Okay, see, these extra terms are being added onto this original system. And the effect of these extra terms is actually to wipe out a few things and give you the slave equations. So even though I start with a master and a slave, and the slave variables are just the, you know, is transferred directly from the master, I, want to, I would like you to think about it as master is one system, slave is another system. And then there is a coupling term between the two of them. And these coupling terms involve the variables of both master and slave. So you see the coupling term over here is x minus x prime times tau minus z prime. And here it is x minus x prime times y prime. So it can involves both the master variables as well as the slave variables. Effectively, you know, that gets, you know, the things cancel out and whatnot, and then I get some other set of equations. But conceptually, I want I would like to get the point of view across that you have one dynamical system, another dynamical system, and coupling terms. And these coupling terms, it's, it's up to you. I mean, we've re earlier written down sine theta, you know, sine phi i minus phi j, right, based on some arguments. My coupling term happens to be of that particular kind, right? Then effectively what I have is a master-slave configuration. Okay. So, yeah. Lord of please. Uh, yeah. Can you have a parameter where you go from uh, two systems that are completely uncoupled, but you can something like an effective coupling step? So Just put an epsilon in front of that. Let epsilon go from zero to one. Uh, yeah. So. Would you expect to see this at, at low values of epsilon? Because here the... Yeah, yeah, you do. You do, actually. So, and what about symmetric case, like if the coupling is done for both the systems? Um, I'm not sure that all these have been explored, but a large <coughs> number of them have. Okay? I'm, I'm, Thank you. See, I'm just introducing a bunch of problems, and then I want to wipe out all these and go to another way of looking at things. Thank you. Okay, so this is a case where the variables of one system became exactly the variables of the other system, right? So after this, after this point over here, let's say at 15 onwards, even my computer is not making a glitch, x is equal to x prime, y is equal to y prime, z is equal to z prime, right? So it's exactly equal. This was 1990. And from 1990 onwards, there have been no fewer than the entire population of Liechtenstein, which has been working on such cases. All right, so just large numbers of people. And one work was to look at a similar 
system. This is called the Rossler oscillator. Uh, and this has a, a, an advantage that the Rossler oscillator is actually always circulating in a plane. Right? And since it is always circulating in a plane, I can immediately apply a, a, you know, some transformation to it and dream up a phase variable. Right? And actually, it's not in, don't have to do a great transformation. Tan inverse y by x will give you a phase. <laughs> so that, that's all that is that is going around. OK, sorry. Uh -huh. And what uh, Pikowski, uh, Rosenblum, and Kurtz did was to look at the following system of two coupled um, Rossler oscillators, uh, I, and J, uh, I and J below tell you 1 and 2, J is not equal to I, et cetera, et cetera. So, and it's a very simple coupling. It's just the simple XJ minus XI term over there. So 1 minus 2 and 2 minus 1. That's all the coupling is. And they observed the following phenomenon that if I took the phi variable corresponding to oscillator 1 and the phi variable corresponding to oscillator 2, for low coupling, these two were just drifting around. right? So phi 1 minus phi 2 just increased linearly. Phi 1 was operating at some wave frequency, phi 2 at some other frequency, and they were just drifting away. The moment you started coupling them, above a certain coupling, the you see, uh, the difference in the phase just vanishes. The phase locked. Right? The phases are still changing, but they are now together moving in sync. Right? At the same time, the amplitudes of the oscillations were just completely uncorrelated. Right? So this is an important kind of synchronization where for two oscillators, you see, it's not possible in all of Kuramoto is just phase synchronization because that's the only variable there is. But here now you have an amplitude variable. The amplitudes are uncorrelated, uh, but the phases are the same. Right? And this is actually a much more common, it's a, it's a weaker kind of synchronization, but it's much more common. And all of you are carrying within you examples of phase synchronization. Uh, your breath and your heartbeats there is a synchrony in that. Okay, So there, there are many, many examples that are known because the amplitudes of these oscillations are not at all the same, but the, the phases are, very, are identical. As a matter of fact, if you look at these uh, variables, uh, you know, so here is a case where you've got completely uncorrelated motion. It doesn't matter what it is. Here, to a careful eye, you'll see that there's a very similar phase variation, even though the amplitudes, because you can see the distinction between the dotted and the dashed curve, uh, sorry, the dashed and the solid curves, you can see a distinction between them. But they are all going up and going down at the same time. And uh, in this case, the variables are identical. And one way to distinguish them is to plot the two variables against each other. So if this is x1 versus x, x1 and x2 as a function of time, you just plot x1 versus x2. If they are uncorrelated, you get a splodge. If they are completely identical, you get a straight line. And if you are in this funny Netherlands over here, uh, you have a curve, which is some evidence of a phase correlation, but not identical correlation. Yeah. All right. OK, so uh, this is the simplest way to detect a certain kind of synchrony. And it's also a way you know, to think about how would you detect correlation between complex systems. You calculate some kind of a correlation function. Right? Or in a simpler case, supposing I have, uh, you know, here is one variable. Uh, these are just chaotic systems. If they are completely uncorrelated, I find that the variables of one system and the other are just all over the place. If they are completely correlated, there they are on this diagonal line. Right? Okay. So the point is that the normal phase space for the two systems, if it is two-dimensional, the fact that they are completely correlated brings you onto a lower space, which is a submanifold of this entire space, 
Okay? So one way to see correlations or coherence or what have you is to ask, is the dynamics on the entire space or is it on a lower dimensional submanifold? All right? And here you can see that here it is in, you know, in these variables, so it's on the completely on the two-dimensional uh, plane over here. Over here, it's on a one-dimensional subspace. Okay? This is called the synchronization manifold. In the context of synchronizing systems, bringing the you see, what you're thinking is that here, uncorrelated motion is going all over the place. But the moment you come down to the correlated motion, you are actually in this whole space, you're coming to a lower dimensional subspace. All right. So you can, yeah. So it was because it looked like uh, the phase was moving sort of periodically also as well, it, which is not Probably necessarily what we OK, so is the Rossler even without the coupling quasi-periodic? No, no, no. The, 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 without the coupling, oops. Without the coupling, oops, without the coupling, it's there. Yeah, so then the coupling is also introducing this periodicity, right? Then is it still chaotic? Uh, well, the coupling is just coupling the two systems. It's a diffusive coupling over here. So uh, this is just as you keep increasing C, you first go from uncorrelated to phase correlated to final full correlation, all right? So it's, there's a great, a gradual move. Yeah. One question. So the, for the Rossler oscillator, you said one nice thing is they are uh, circulating, they're always circulating in a plane. Yeah. No. So it's not circulating. I mean, there's just the projection on the plane. Okay. Uh, it, that's what is happening to Z. Okay. So the X So it's going around and up and down and up and down and up and down. Okay. Yeah. I mean, there are some symmetries over here, but it, this is not on a plane. So you still have to take the Z into account. It's not uncoupled or anything. It's not uncoupled. <laughs> yeah. All right. So uh, yeah. So if I, uh, there's more than one way to couple such systems. All right. So if I take two copies of Lorentz, now I'm calling them X and Y. Way, you know, the X Lorentz and the Y Lorentz, and now I couple a, couple this one with a term epsilon times x1 minus y1. And over here, I put epsilon minus epsilon x1 minus y1. Just take the two systems. And I put in purely diffusive coupling. For sufficiently large epsilon, they do correlate. Uh, they do synchronize. As a matter of fact, uh, I'm not even going to draw the orbits anymore. The uncoupled orbits is a splotch. The moment I couple them, Boom! You're onto a lower dimensional submanifold, all right? And uh, it's not just that the moment you couple them, you're going to get the synchrony. You can couple them, and it can still be unsynchronized for if epsilon is sufficiently small. You get splotch, and then you go onto the straight line. All right. So, so there is a you, you know so. You, for a long time, at least, people were just looking at the following, that I have a Lorenz, or I have a Rossler, or I have a harmonic oscillator, or this, or that, or the other. And how do I get it to synchronize? Well, I take one Lorenz, I take another Lorenz. Or I take a pendulum, I take another pendulum. I take a Kuramoto oscillator, I take another Kuramoto oscillator, all that. So if I take systems which are identical or similar, I can mutually couple them. I can have a master and a slave, all right? And there's another uh, way of doing it is that both, I mean, I have two systems. Both of them are not communicating with each other, but are driven by something else at the top. Like all of us are driven by the sun, right? OK. So complete synchronization, as I pointed out, is the, the orbits are identical. Phase synchronization is that they oscillate in the same way, right? And there is a concept of what is called generalized synchronization, which I'm just going to segue into. 
Uh, I'm just going to introduce that idea over here, and then we'll come back to it in uh, tomorrow's lecture. All right. So all these can be put within a general framework, which is called generalized synchronization, which is more than either complete or phase. Oh, there, there are as many variations virtually as there are people. There is lag synchronization, anticipatory synchronization, relay synchronization, delay synchronization, etc. Okay. I want to just close today with, with reminding you of some very classical physics that you've done. If I take a simple harmonic oscillator, Q double dot plus omega naught squared Q is equal to zero, but then I force it with for, forcing it by cosine omega t, then I don't know why I have two pluses over there, I'm sorry. Uh, for if the frequency omega and omega naught are not the same, then you know that the solution has a term which comes from the original uh, harmonic oscillator, and then it has a term which comes from the forcing. So the system basically responds to the frequency at which it is forced plus its own intrinsic frequency. Of course, if you have a resonance condition, you have both where omega is equal to omega naught, you have the original frequency, and then the drive frequency is omega naught, uh, but then you also have the secular growth, which is unstable. All right? So when you take one system and you force it by another, I just want to point out that you get both the original frequency as well as some of the driving frequency. I'm just saying the same thing over here. Now, if I look at this particular equation, I can think of cosine omega t as the output of some other oscillator. Right? So if I take an oscillator which is in some variable y, it doesn't matter. Okay, y double dot plus omega squared y will have the solution f cosine omega t for some particular choice of initial conditions. So I can write this as q double dot, I mean I can write what is intrinsically a non-autonomous system as an autonomous system, where the driving is coming from this variable, but notice the structure of this. The structure is what's mathematically called a skew product. Uh, namely, that the equations of y do not involve q, and the equations of q involve y. All right? So this is a very uh, important kind of for thinking about ourselves and the sun. All our actions over here do not affect the sun, whereas the sun affects us. All right? So this sort of asymmetry in the coupling, if you like, is really a evidence of skew product geometry over here, or skew product structure. And what one, what one can ask is that, see, so think of this as the master. The master's dynamics is unaffected by that of the slave, whereas the slave has the dynamics of the master thrown in. Right? How does one generalize this particular idea? And that is, uh, okay. So I will come to this point in tomorrow's lecture, which is basically that generalized synchrony is the study of this kind of phenomenon. In It started out as a study in skew product systems, but of course it has extended much beyond that these days. Okay, And I cannot resist showing you a picture of uh, where eventually we are going. Right? So here is a picture of some birds. Right? So these, this is just a, uh, a time-lapse image of a flock of birds that is flying. And uh, what you see over there are the wings. You know, the, I mean, this is just a superposition of many time-lapsed uh, images. But uh, here is a flock of birds that is flying together. And, uh, Here's a direct example of oscillators. It's just a visual oscillations over there. But you can see the flapping of the wings is an oscillation. Stop oscillating, you die. Right? And uh, 
you're moving in a flock because swarms keep you safe. So here is a direct example of flocking and uh, swarming. And uh, so what we are working towards, at least for tomorrow's lecture, is to describe how how two random birds can meet up and decide to synchronize. Yeah? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. But it's not, it's not, uh, it's not perfect, I mean, there's a lag synchronization. Because that, with the lag synchronization, you pick up on the airflow. Right? If you take a picture of you know, 10 birds that are flying in a line, you can just draw the wave. Anyway, so we'll stop over here for today.
So is it okay if I restart now? Okay. Um, I think for the sake of all of us, I'm going to try and summarize what we did before, including for myself. So the, the first lecture, I tried to give you like broad uh, explanations about the glass transition. So the fluid to solid transition as you cool down the system. We described how density fluctuations were not changing too much and the system remains uh, homogeneous and disordered and a little bit boring. We described the slow dynamics, this two-step decay, the fact that relaxation times in the dynamics get very large. We also said, I also told you yesterday, if you look at the spatial correlations of how fast the particles are moving, you discover these dynamic heterogeneities, which is the idea that particles have to correlate in a non-trivial way in order to relax the structure of the system. And that probably is correlated or connected to some kind of underlying phase transition that we want to uh, uh, discuss uh, more today. Then I told you a lot about this configurational entropy that's changing, which is the one thing in the structure, in the thermodynamic property that's changing very dramatically or rather sharply as you approach the glass transition. Then I skipped this for reasons of time. And then I moved into mean field theory. So I say, okay, there is this whole range of approaches that where you can do exact calculations in some specific mathematical limit. And I call that mean field theory. And the structure of these approaches are all the same. And we started by thinking about the dynamics of these mean field uh, glasses. I described the dynamics of this particular model, the spherical P-spin model. And I've told you the one, fir the first thing that happens in that system is as you cool down the uh, temperature, you will hit a critical temperature where the relaxation time is going to diverge, but in the power law fashion at some temperature that I called uh, dynamical uh, temperature. So I skip some of this. And so that transition, we call it the dynamical transition in the context of the mean field. And I told you it has deep, strong connection with this other approach that people have developed called the mode coupling theory. So sometimes instead of calling it the dynamic transition, people call it the mode coupling transition. And as we, I think, already started to discuss yesterday, that transition is going to not survive finite dimensional fluctuations. So usually people talk about the mode coupling, uh, either they keep saying the mode coupling transition or the dynamic transition, but toward in late years they have shifted towards the mode coupling crossover. And so people are fighting about, is this crossover strong? Is it interesting? It's a big uh, chapter in uh, glass physics. So that's all about the dynamics. So mean field models have a dynamic transition at a well-defined uh, critical temperature. So what I want to do uh, today is keep going with the mean field uh, construction and tell you what happens if you don't look only at how the spins are relaxing, which is what we did when we wrote down this equation of motion yesterday for the spin-spin correlation function. But what if you compute thermodynamic quantities and you probe very deeply the structure of the configuration space and how it's fractured, how it's changing as you uh, decrease the temperature towards what is going to happen at lower temperature, which is a Kautzmann transition, which is exactly realized in this mean field model. So that's the program for today. Uh, get to lower temperature and think about the thermodynamic or the static properties of these mean field uh, models. As I said, all of them are the same, but it's simpler for me to go and quote results for the spherical p spin models because it's simpler to describe. And analytically, that's probably the one model that has been studied uh, the most, I think. Hundreds of papers have been dedicated to understanding very precisely the geometry nature of the configuration space in the p spin model. I'm going to spend half an hour describing it for you, but you, you need to trust me because it's really the result of a gigantic collective effort to really understand that model in its, uh, 
in its details, okay? So what about uh, the statics? And the one thing that I think is the most striking discovery of this model is the emergence of metastable states, metastable aggressive states, okay? So since the, uh, so I told you these models were, they were starting to get investigated in the mid-1980s, okay? Uh, so right after spin glasses were studied heavily in the context of replica symmetry breaking and everything, people discovered this new class of spin glasses with different kinds of uh, transition and they started to investigate their properties. So all the spin glass people, a large fraction of the spin glass people started to look at the properties of this model. So the, the same names that have made discoveries for spin glasses reappear here in the context of the P-spin model or the POTS model that I mentioned before. And so one of these uh, papers that is often cited is a paper by Thaulas, Anderson, and Palmer, uh, whose, yeah, I don't recall, but it, it's, a, it's a paper that now people quote, but the uh, first letters of all the names. So Thaulas is the guy who got the Nobel Prize for the 2 the xy model, the costalis thaulas transition. And Anderson also got a Nobel Prize for the Anderson localization, and Palmer probably was good, but he didn't get one, okay? Uh, uh, and all these guys were working on spin glasses and developed an approach to try and understand uh, the complexity of the free energy landscape of these spin glasses. And what the tab paper is about is about writing down a free energy and minimizing and trying to find how many free energy minima that you have in the P-spin model as you decrease the temperature. Try to understand something about the complexity of the free energy landscape. And so the main result that they got is that, and this is what I'm going to write now, that for a given value of the free energy, they could show that they could discover a large number of uh, solutions for how you minimize the free energy. And more precisely, there exist an exponential number of solutions. Of free energy minima. Okay, so if you solve for a free energy minima, if you want to discover minima in the free energy, which are giving you the states of the system in equilibrium, Instead of having one, say it's the ferromagnetic state, here you have an exponential number of them. So exponential number means if I look at the number of states between F and F plus DF as usual, then that number of states uh, is equal to N of F times DF, where that number of solution N of F is a density of the solution if you wish. And that's the key thing, it's exponential in the system size. So if you have a larger and larger system, the, that number of solution you'll find will grow exponentially with the system size or with the prefactor. And that prefactor is sigma of f. And in that time, the sigma of f number, the prefactor here was called the complexity. Okay, so it quantifies how fast with uh, n, what's the prefactor of this, how fast is growing the number of solutions when you increase the number of spins in your system. And of course, in the thermodynamic limit, it's infinite, but what matters is how it's growing with n. And they called it uh, complexity. Okay, why complexity? It means if you have a free energy landscape with many, very many minima, and very many means exponential n when is in large, so that's very many. If you have a potential a free energy landscape with very many minima, it means the system can you know, explore those minima. And this is what we usually call a complex system. A complex system is a system which can really be found in a large number of different states. And the complexity emerges because I told you, we have put quench disorder and these interactions into the system. And this is how complexity and a rugged free energy landscape and a large number of potential states is emerging. So that's why we call it complexity. That's the defining uh, nature of uh, complex systems, first of all. Second of all, if you think just one more minute about what it means, that sigma, you could say, I'm going to take the log here, so I'm going to take the log of n, and I'm dividing by one over n, and I will get sigma. So sigma is one over n, the log of the number of states that I find. 
So what is the nature of sigma then in terms of a thermodynamic quantity? If it's one over n log the number of states, louder, please. It's an entropy, so I can read on your <laughs> lips. So if I do something, yeah, indeed. So if you think this is the number of states and I take the log of the number of states, that's what I called yesterday an entropy. So the log of microstates is the total entropy. <coughs> and we say it when we discussed, uh, <coughs> I'm sorry. <coughs> when we discussed the approach of Katzmann, we say what Katzmann wanted to count by subtracting the entropy of the crystal, for instance, he wanted to count the, the different number of packings in the system. So that's the exact analog here. What you have is you have a distinct, you're counting the number of free energy minima. There would be vibrations around each of these free energy minima, if you wish. So we can just, you know, think of the system like this. These are, you know, distinct minima, and that what this complexity is counting is their number. And so, in a sense, that complexity is really in the context of the uh, spin glass model that we are discussing. This is the configurational entropy. Okay. So I think I told you when I introduced the, comp the configurational entropy of Katzmann that that number goes under very many names. So one of those names, and that's probably the most precise one, is the complexity, which is counting the number of free energy minima. And you can do that calculation, and they have done it exactly. And you can then compute that uh, con uh, configurational entropy, that complexity. So what did they find, these guys? They find the following picture for how sigma depends on the value of the free energy. And that's, again, the result of an exact calculation within one of these models, the P-spin model. But again, this type of behavior is found on all of them. And they found something like this that if you ask that the free energy is very large, then you don't find a large number, it's just a, a highly disordered state. If you ask that the free energy is super low, you find no solution to the problem. And there is an intermediate free energy regime, again, it's an exact result, where that complexity is uh, uh, non-zero and you can compute uh, it for specific models, for instance. So there is a, a region in free energy values in between which you have this large number of uh, free energy states. If you are at a higher level, the free energy landscape is totally trivial. If you want to go very low in free energy, you find no solution at all. And in some intermediate band, then you find a large, exponentially large in the system size number of states. So that's what I think you should try and uh, visualize. So that's a configuration space that I'm sketching in one dimension, and you should imagine that each the configuration space in that range of free energies, it's really broken into a large number of different states. So that's the one possibility to cartoon it in your head. The other possibility is the one I used before. If this is the configuration space, then it's really broken into a large number of distinct pockets. So these crosses are just like this. And you know, you could explore a little bit uh, the neighborhood of those states, but this is what you do. So it's like the configuration space breaks into individual pockets and it, the pockets don't talk to each other. And sigma is enumerating the number of those distinct pockets. Okay, again, complex, rugged free energy landscape or broken, you know, Whatever picture is more appealing to you, that's the idea that the system finds a large number of different states and that can be proven exactly. And that's the essence of the problem. It's the emergence of complexity from this uh, many word interactions plus quench disorder. You can prove that you know these uh, things are emerging as a result of the interactions. <coughs> Sorry. Yes. Can you, Can you explain again, like, why for high values of uh, free energy uh, there is no number of 
minimum. So remember the friend and, okay. Uh, so can you wait a minute and I go back to your question after I've done the next uh, okay. figure? I think it's yeah. going to be clearer. So okay. uh, if I forget about you, you raise your hand again. Yeah. Each right. can, sorry, each can no, like, so this free energy is the free energy for the whole sample, let's say, or whole system, right? But even if I, again, mentally break the system into, let's say, several parts, and each part can be in different free energy minima for the sub part? Okay, so it, 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 it's, it's, uh, it's, it's a naive but very deep question. Mm -hmm. uh, so, again, I hope it's going to be clarified a little bit later. The quick answer is record what we did when we define the Hamiltonian, we say all spins interact with everybody. Yeah. So how do you break a mean field model into two pieces that don't talk to each other? You can't. So the main thing is you're asking a question about what's the real space picture of that thing? And I'm telling you I'm deriving everything with space. There's no space, space basically. And so what I'll do hopefully later, if I can, is I'll try to tell you, okay, that's a very nice, beautiful construction for non-special systems in the lim midfield limit. Yeah. If you think about space, what's happening, and this is, okay, again, a question I would like to answer today. Okay. So, so come back again if you're not satisfied, yeah. but this is where we are going. Okay. Sorry? You mean Ising spins with the P-spin interactions or no, the pure Ising model? I just want to compare what the complexity would look like for... There is no complexity in the Ising model. You have one state. It's the positively... Or you have two. Okay? You have either you're positively magnetized or you're negatively magnetized. And in the paramagnet, it's just one state. So it's one or two states in the thermodynamic limit. You can be in two states. And here in the thermodynamic limit, you can be an infinite number of states. So the only analogy with the Isaac model, it would be I can be in that state plus, uh, plus one, plus two, plus three, plus up to plus infinity. That an infinitely large number of different states you can uh, uh, fall in in that system, as opposed to only two for the pure Isaac model. This is why we call it a complex system again. It means I do my experiments a hundred times, I find a hundred different types of configurations. You do 100 simulations of the Ising model, you find two states. Uh, but that is that uh, for paramagnetic uh, state, I mean, there could be many possibilities. No, but the state, what I'm saying here is the state, the global state of the system, is it magnetized or not? Uh, I'm not talking about the state of one spin. This is configuration space. I'm describing the entire system here, not, not one spin. Uh, yeah, that's why uh, in Ising, there will be many states, right? For a give, I mean, for a m equals to zero state, you, you're confusing. I think states and microstates. Microstates are just you know microscopic realizations of the fields. Yeah. That's a microstate. A state is is it magnetized or is it not magnetized? Oh, so this infinite number of states. These are not <coughs> microstates you're talking. Sorry, what did? Well, it, again, you do the calculation, you look at for your minima, you find solutions uh, from here, and you stop finding solutions from there. And these are numbers that you compute. You know, it's, it's the outcome of a calculation. And that's the result I want to give it to you, and I want to perhaps uh, keep going now. I want to explore this, what are the consequences, and I want to make the connection between that result that comes from I'm just deriving the free energy and minimizing the free energy to find free energy minima, which is what this calculation is about. Yeah. I find this large number and I draw the number of solutions I find and that's the result. And now what I would like to do, if I may, is keep going and what are the consequences on the phase transition for that system? Here we haven't talked about the temperature, we just say this is the free energy. What I want to do now is move and say what is the system doing when I'm going to call the temperature given that I know this information about the structure of the free energy landscapes. So, so please allow me to continue. Yeah. So in other words, like, uh, so the deepest minima is probably unique, right? Uh, this part? The deepest free energy minima is probably unique, right? Given <laughs> that you have a continuous Z. Yeah, but again, you're looking for how many minima exist at a given level e of free energy. E and, and I'm going, again, to go to the temperature and try uh, and answer your question. 
Okay. So let me go just five more minutes. <laughs> so for a given temperature, right? So the system this should. This is what I'm going to yeah, do yeah, now. Yeah, yeah, I understand that. That's the reason half of a question. So, so the system essentially is happy here, right? Like that's it, right? It doesn't need to move on at all, right? Because I have found like infinite number of free energy minimum, and that's it for a given temperature. Yeah, yeah. I, I hope I'm going to clarify everything. So please allow yeah, me to please, keep going. Please go ahead. And I'll, I'll do a summary at the end. And if you're not happy, please ask uh, many half questions. Okay. Okay, let's keep going and let's try to connect this picture with the um, the Kurtzman transition. This is what I do, okay? So what I want to do is I want to, you know, do the statistical mechanics of that system given that I know something about the uh, structure of the free energy uh, landscape of that system. So, I mean, I'll do it maybe very quickly. So I have introduced this density of state. So let me write down just the, the partition function and I just jump a few lines to go directly there and then give you the result. So let me write it and then... Okay, so what we do when we want to do the statistical mechanics of a system like this, because we know the results about the free energy, so we write down the partition function as the sum of the free energies of all these systems, and that number is as I said before, it's the number of, uh, free of uh, free energy minima that I have. So this is the number of free energy minima per delta F, and each free energy minima will contribute uh, its own partition function to the system. So Z equal equals exponential minus beta NF is the definition of the free energy. It's just the definition of the connection between the partition function and uh, the free energy. So I'm just writing down something stupid. This is the partition function of a minimum, and this is how many minima I have. So when I sum, I have the total partition function. I don't do much here, okay? It's just uh, formal manipulations from the first definitions you learn about statistical uh, physics. I'm just rewriting it to make it like uh, you did yesterday. So I'm going to rewrite it like this, minus n beta. So I have f, and then I have minus t sigma. Okay, so what I did, I just put n in front to have like an exponential n thing. And remember, we are doing uh, statistical physics. So we are taking n to large, and we want to do an integral with an exponential with a large prefactor inside. So I think we heard the name yesterday, so it should be very quick today. How do we solve it? Yes. <laughs> you did a good job. Okay, so you do a saddle point. So you need to minimize this with respect to the uh, uh, free energy. Okay, oops. So we solve it by saddle point, and the saddle point is then 1 my x is equal to t d sigma by df. Okay, and that would be defining my saddle point uh, solution. So why is it, uh, so I just take the derivative, f goes to 1, and this is uh, d sigma by df, and when this is 0, this it's the maximum that's coming to dominate the integral. So it means when the derivative of sigma of f divided by f is equal to 1 over t, that's my saddle point. And this is why we like to draw that picture. It means if this, uh, if this orange straight line has slope 1 over t, so I just drew the 1 over t here, and that's the derivative of the curve sigma f. So this is my saddle point. Okay. So you'll see that I'll have a problem when the temperature is changed because when the temperature is changed, I may or may not find a solution to the sidal point equation. But let's assume that I find a solution in the right regime here. I call it F star. And so if I put, you know, the sidal point is that F is equal to F star. So I put F star into that business. And so I can solve for my uh, integral. And so Z is the, is the exponential of that guy at the sidal point. If I take the log of z, I have the total free energy. So overall, I have that the, F, the equilibrium free energy, which is the log of that guy, essentially. It will be equal to f star minus t sigma of f of f star. OK, and that's all I need to know. I mean, I won't do much more than this in terms of the thermodynamics. And so I determine my saddle point by this uh, geometric construction. And this is the free energy of the system at equilibrium, okay? 
So what have we done? We have done the following thing. We have said, okay, there is an exponentially large number of metastable states that contribute to the free energy. And so what we find is that the free energy of the total system is the free energy of the states that dominate the saddle point minus an entropic contribution. Okay, so, and how does this uh, go? So you, you know that the system wants, in principle, to minimize its free energy. So there are states that have a lower free energy. So you could say, if I want to decrease that guy, I could decrease this by going to deeper and deeper minima. But if you decrease F star here, you will also decrease the sigma. And so if you decrease sigma, this is less negative, and it's not good. On the opposite, you could say, I'm going to maybe explore more states. I'm going to increase or decrease the free energy by increasing that guy. But if you go to more states, you gain entropy, but you lose because that guy becomes larger. So what I'm telling you is that the equilibrium properties of the system are a fine balance between I want to be very deep, but if I'm too deep, I have less state, so I'm losing entropy. And so as usual, it's a competition between energy and entropy. And this is how the system finds you know, the right value of the free energy that it wants to explore at a given temperature by minimizing as much as it can the free, the free energy of the states, so getting deeper and deeper. But if you go too deep, you lose the entropy contribution, so you should not do this. And this is the compromise that the system finds, this compromise between exploring many states or not. Okay, so we have solved for the uh, free energy. So when we solve the saddle point, then we have an explicit connection at each temperature, if you wish. I have a given saddle point, which is given by that construction. So we can look at what is the temperature evolution of the entropy contribution to the free energy. So we can now, you know, at a given temperature, what would be the entropy contribution to the free energy? So what would be the configurational entropy or the complexity in the Pispin language? And this is what we find. So that's temperature and that's the sigma of T. So I've, I've told you the construction to find F star is really this uh, uh, geometric construction. I'm looking at the slope. So if the temperature is very large, 1 over t will be small, and then the slope will be very small. I don't find a solution here. So if the temperature is too large, there is no solution to the saddle point. And then I should maybe use color for this thing. So if the temperature is too high, I find no solution, so sigma is not uh, defined. Okay? That's the high temperature thing. At high temperature, I don't need to think about the complexity. I'm flying high above here, and the complexity of the landscape I don't feel. Now there comes the temperature, which is given by you know the temperature at which the slope that you find here of the F max is equal to the slope of the curve. And by magic, again, it, it emerges from direct calculations. You know nothing about the dynamics, but the dynamic temperature we discussed yesterday by solving the Langevin equation for the spins it reappears in that very static calculations where you didn't use the dynamics at all. It's the same temperature. And that slope here is really one over TD. And this is when you discover that you have a solution. When you have a solution, the solution is large. So the configurational entropy at TD is jumping to a large value, which is this number here, if you wish, sigma max. And that's sigma max, OK? at this right same temperature. Then the temperature decreases, so the slope is growing, 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 and so your solution is decreasing, decreasing, decreasing. Okay, so you have that the sigma of t is going to be smaller and smaller, and then there comes a temperature where finally you reach the F min, okay? You're stuck here, and so you call that temperature, and the solution for the subtle point would be sigma equals to zero. And so, I will, for uh, to uni unify all the notations I have in the lectures, I will call this the Cosman transition. And if I go below, then I no longer have a configurational entropy. Okay. So what we discover is that because of the structure of the landscape, and we just do you know some uh, stat make calculation for this model, 
We discovered that there are two temperatures that are important in terms of the thermodynamics of that system. At high temperature, there is no complexity. The system is high above, you know, this low-lying state. Doesn't care much at all. It can, you know, really explore very freely the free energy landscape. No complexity, no problem. Then we cross that one temperature and we are stuck in one of these pockets here. So the system finds one state and it's stuck there forever. So, and, you know, it's finding one of these uh, very many large number of states. And as you decrease the temperature, you have less and less and less of this uh, free energy minima up until the Kurtzman transition where you're really stuck and the configuration that entropy goes to zero. So that's the two temperatures. These are the two temperatures that emerge by looking at the statistical mechanics of this problem. And this one, again, and it's no accident, it's the dynamical transition, OK? So it's the same as the dynamics. OK, so in terms of the structure of the configuration uh, space, it would mean in that thing, you know, I have, I have a liquid. It's very simple. And the configuration space, it's really you know, one basic giant basins when I can really explore the configuration space very, very easily, and there are no complexity in the system. At intermediate temperature here, which is the intermediate temperature regime where the complexity matters, you can imagine that the configuration space really has the structure it has over there. You know, it's broken in an infinitely, exponentially large number of states. And when the system is in one of those states, it stays there forever. And so in terms of the dynamics of the system, when I'm stuck here in a restricted part of the free energy landscape, of the configuration space, I'm not ergodic. So I'm losing ergodicity here. Okay, so ergodicity last. And the loss, the loss of ergodicity corresponds to the emergence of that complexity. I'm stuck there, and I have to stay there forever. And there is a third regime where, you know, not only ergodicity is broken, but you're really stuck in a very narrow part of the landscape. And it's just one guy, you know, it's just the, the glass uh, state here. And the complexity associated to that uh, landscape is uh, vanishing. So the key thing that we've discovered by that calculation, so the, the loss of ergodicity we had guessed by doing the dynamics yesterday. So we say, as we approach that TD, it's slower, 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 and the relaxation time is diverging there. Ergodicity is lost into the glass, remember I showed you. So this one we had discovered by the dynamics. This one we discover only by the statics, the thermodynamics. And it corresponds to I have less and less and less and less of these metastable states up to the point where they disappear altogether, the configurational entropy goes to zero. So this is the Kautzmann transition. Okay? And in this uh, P-spin model, that transition is really a thermodynamic transition. It's really a discontinuity in thermodynamic properties. So this is a genuine thermodynamic phase transition. So I, I had announced that result long ago. I said, oh, Kurtzman discovered that by looking at data for the configurational entropy, if you extrapolate and you think a little bit, you may have a hint of a phase transition governed by the rarefaction of uh, the number of states that you explore. That's exactly realized in that model. It's not put by hand. It's, it's a fictitious, you know, non-physical spin glass model with disorder, fine. But it's exactly realizing the Kurtzman transition, and you can show it and compute it and understand its properties. And so the key features of the uh, mean field theory, if you wish, is the emergence of these two temperatures. One temperature where you know complexity and a rugged free energy landscape emerges, dictating the dynamics. And the second temperature where this complexity is vanishing, the configurational entropy is vanishing, and it's a genuine thermodynamic phase transition. Okay, so this is really the big mean field picture, the emergence of those two temperatures. In a mean field picture, the intermediate one is like a super cool liquid, and then the last one is glass. In is the it? mean field picture, I've told you yesterday, the yeah. dynamics remain has a finite correlation time here, and it's it's diverging there. So in the mean field, in terms of 
what's the dynamics of the system? It's ergodic up to here, and it's non-ergodic below TD. Okay. This is what we saw with the dynamics. Mm -hmm. Just telling you, the dynamics doesn't tell you anything about this one. The mean field dynamics doesn't tell you. But the structure of the landscape keeps changing, and it has this thermodynamic transition. So in terms of if you want to call a glass uh, a system that's not ergodic, that's We'll a. call it a TD. If you want to call a glass a system that no longer has a complexity, that's this phase. So that's, you know. OK. Uh, and for reasons that, again, are going to be clear, this is the genuine thermodynamic phase transition between a system whose free energy you know, has no singularity of any kind. As you cross TD here, you know, you em those things keep compensating each other, but nothing happens for the total thermodynamics. So if, if you follow this guy, and you don't distinguish between F and sigma contributions to the free energy, as you cross TD, nothing happens. And it's only here that you have a singularity. So for, from the point of view of uh, the thermodynamics, this is boring, 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 a little bit interesting, but this is why you have a discontinuity. So this is where the phase transition from the viewpoint of thermodynamics takes place. And so we, for reasons that I'm going again to explain, we like to call this thing the glass or even the ideal glass because this is all done in equilibrium. This is the ideal glass phase and this is a liquid. But again, that dashed line I draw because I think about the thermodynamics. If you want to think about the dynamics, we did that yesterday, and this is where you lose ergodicity. Mm -hmm. So it's a bit strange, and I'm, I'll keep going with that. And this one goes like t minus tk to the power some power, right? Uh, it's going to zero. For what quantity? No, this uh, uh, sigma of t goes to zero as t yeah, minus tk exactly. to the power. Yeah, exactly. I mean, power. it's just the, this, this sigma is just the difference between two functions, so it, it's nothing dramatic. It's linear there, if you wish. Yeah. It's no. one, is it? Yeah. Okay. It's just vanishing as a normal, so you know. I mean, does a, it? It's just a function crossing zero. No does it have its own universality class, or like in terms of the? Let uh, me keep going a little ah, bit okay. again. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm trying to think whether I skip this one. I'll half skip it. So in the spirit of. Uh, the half questions, I'll do half of uh, what I wanted to say. So I'll, this, I'll mention it because for So I'll mention this. So I told you when you do the pace spin, it's easy. You can do everything you like because it's all uh, exact. When you want to treat <coughs> an off-lattice atomistic model. You have two choices. You make harsh approximations to get there. This is what I'm going to describe in a minute. You do what the uh, people have done lately. They, you move to very large dimensions, and again, you do calculations that are exact, and you can compute uh, everything you like. Just like you can compute everything for the Pesmin model, you can compute everything for infinite dimensional uh, liquids. So what I want to mention in three lines is what people had devised before going to the large delimit to treat and understand something about or predict something analytically for the properties of the configurational entropy in off lattice uh, liquid models. That will be analytical. The next thing you can do, and I hope I'll, I'll cover this in the last lecture, is you can go and do computer simulations of your favorite 3D liquid and try to estimate that complexity, that configurational entropy. It's not easy either, and we'll spend some time discussing it later. So what I want to do is how you can make approximation from statistical mechanics with, you know, and control approximations. for, say, 3D liquids, okay, so I just, and so those uh, works were done, I won't say much about the papers, but it's Monasson, 1995, and the people who took the idea of Monasson and pushed them to really get to actual predictions for real liquids, uh, really uh, Marc Meza and Giorgio Parisi, 
probably 1999 and following years there are several papers. So I mentioned the method for two reasons. First of all, so Giorgio is involved, so replica calculations are involved, okay? That means it involves replica calculations. That's one reason why I want to do it, so at least you hear the name and you think about disordered systems and uh, Giorgio Parisi. The second reason is that, at least in spirit, it's a little bit similar to what we just did. So it's really based on this idea that we know the underlying landscape, there is this sigma wave function, and we want to predict for liquid how to compute that function. So the, I'm going to write down again a partition function, and this is all I'm going to do, okay? I'm just going to give you uh, the idea. So replica calculations are involved. It means instead of solving the thermodynamic of one system, you solve the thermodynamic of M uh, cloned system, M replicas of the system, which is the way that, uh, you know, Paris and others had used to solve and understand the physics of disordered systems. So the idea, first of all, is you introduce M replicas of your system, okay? So that's idea number one. So the idea of cloning the system to help understand and solve statistical mechanical problem with uh, quench disorder. Introduce replicas. So the second thing that uh, Mona Sunday is, I'm going to copy the system m times and I'm assuming that the replicas are coupled. Okay. And coupled means I introduce m copies of the system and all these copies is M uh, orange copies of the system. They all explore the same state because they are coupled together strongly. They cannot be found in different states. I force them to be explore the same state. That's the setup. This is what Monasson did uh, in this paper. He takes M copies, couple them, and force them to be the same state. If you do this, why did he do it? Okay. You go back and you say, I'm going to compute the partition function of my replicated system. So he says, I'm going to write down a partition function for M copies of the system. And just by copying uh, N sigma of F minus beta N M F, okay? So the, that what, this is what I want to do. I want to look at the structure of that thing. So where is M intervening, it's intervening in front of this? So I have M copy, so the free energy is M times the free energy of one copy. But the number of state, it's still the same because you know the structure of the landscape hasn't changed. So I'm just putting the copies in the same state and I introduce the M. And that's it, that's what the calculation is about. And the rest of the calculation is really reproducing the saddle point equation like this up to this point. But now with M copies, and you discover that the saddle point, if I can find it, uh, it's becoming d sigma by dF is equal to M divided by T, if I'm not mistaken. Okay, so the M which is here will just arrive here and it's going to approach uh, this uh, saddle point. So that's the saddle point equation now. And if you forget the physical interpretation of M in terms of, you know, this is M systems, you can think of it as like a trick. You know, it's a number that's changing the saddle point equation. So now the saddle point equation, when you introduce M copies of the system, so I have, of course it's disappeared. I should redraw it again. Remember what we had, we had a curve like this, we had something like this with f, and we said the saddle point is when the derivative of the function sigma of f is equal to one over t, and now it's equal to m divided by t. So I can think of m as a tool to by changing continuously m, I can just explore the curve sigma of f by having this new parameter, and this is mathematically how it works, okay? So m is a trick to explore that curve with a new parameter, and that's it. This is what these people have done. So you do your calculation as we did before, you express the free energy, etc., and you have the free energy of the replicated system. So you have the free energy of the replicated system. I don't know why I call it I could call it fx 
of MMT by solving the subtle point equation. So now you have this new parameter, you can play with it. And I think the way it's done, just to finish, it's you write down the derivative of this with respect to M. So you're playing with M and you get uh, the uh, free energy at the subtle point. And from this, you can also get, which is the most important thing, sigma of M M T, which is sigma of F star, which is, I'm just writing it, but it's, the details don't matter, right? Just, I will explain in a minute why this is useful. Anyway, it's just the expression. So what do these people do? They say, we introduce a fictitious number of copies in the system. We do the thermodynamics of this couple fictitious uh, system. We have all the formulas, and if we can express and solve by some approximation the free energy of this fictitious system, I have a formula that gives me the complexity at the end. Okay? So that was the goal of these guys. And the trick to get there is by, again, solving the, the equations that were known for the P-spin model. And the only trick where you know, they needed to introduce and uh, do approximations in terms of liquid state theory, as it's stressed, is how to solve the statistical mechanics of a cloned liquid with M copies of the system. If you can do this, the rest is just applying uh, textbook formulas. So this is what these people have done. They have devised ways to understand the statistical mechanics of liquids when they are coupled together, and they have published papers about that. This is what they have done in those four years. But once this is done, and this is where your microscopic model arrives, you can express and extract all the physical quantities you like. And if you have the configurational entropy, then you have predictions for this, and then you have predictions for that number, uh, that number just by solving equations from liquid state theory. So that was uh, a big uh, thing uh, at the time. Yes? Yeah, yeah, M copies, but the copies explore the states together. So the entropic contribution of these guys exploring different states is just the total number of states that they can explore. Mm -hmm. So this, this, you're asking, I think, why don't I have an M times sigma in front? And I'm telling you the reason is that assumption. You should think of a group of liquids that explore sigma of F sigma of f uh, states, but they explore them together, and they, they cannot explore them independently because I have coupled them. So that's the key. That's why m only appears here, because you have m copies, so they count n times for the free energy, but just one time the entropy, because they moved and explored the configuration space together. I still have a confusion in a sense that, let's say you have two particles. When we couple two particles, the phase space itself grows, right? So if you're coupling M particles, I mean M copies, the phase space should increase. No, I'm just telling you this landscape is given by the pair interactions between two particles. And I'm telling you now I take M copies of the same system, and they are forced to explore like this. So the landscape is given by the Hamiltonian. It was given at the very beginning. can talk about it. Okay, so I'm trying to go and move towards the other questions I had before. So this is the structure of the phase transitions for the mean field models. So we had questions yesterday that I left unanswered, and you, we had questions earlier about the uh, thing. The next thing I want to say, so it's V, so it's becoming E is I've told you from the thermodynamic viewpoint, you have this entropy that goes to zero, has a discontinuity, and I've told you this is the Kautzmann transition. It's a thermodynamic phase transition. I think someone yesterday asked, but what's the other parameter associated to this? And this is what I want to discuss now. So what's the other parameter? That's telling me that you know I am in the liquid, and then I move to the glass, and that's the question that uh, you were asking about: uh, what is the liquid, what is the glass? Usually, if, when you have a phase transition, you also define another parameter that's zero in one phase, 
and non-zero in another phase. And how it's changing across the uh, phase transition is telling you whether the phase transition is first order or second order. So what I've told you is that sigma has some kind of discontinuity, so it, it is a phase transition. I haven't told you what's the nature of the phase transition and what's the other parameter associated to this, and this is what I want to do uh, now, okay? So we are still living in the world of disordered system and replicas, so I'm, I'm going to define the other parameter and I will give you like an intuition for why this is a good other parameter for that transition, okay? Okay, so the other parameter that I'm going to define, it's defined for pairs of configurations, okay? So in the previous example, I took M copies of the system. Now I'm just taking two copies of the system. By this, I mean you have the Boltzmann distribution. You draw one configuration weighted you know, with the equilibrium Boltzmann distribution. Then you take another equilibrium configurations, and then you have your pair of equilibrium configurations. So that's the first thing you need to do. So for instance, for the spins, you would have spins one for, you know, one to n, and then you would have all the list of the spin values for i one to n. And this is your first configuration. This is your second configuration. And the quantity that you would like to define is the comparison between these two um, configuration, it's called the overlap. I'm going to define it and describe to you what it means. So in the context of the spin glass model, again, you would have from I1 to N, SI1, SI2. Okay, so I draw one configuration, I draw another configuration too, and now I'm constructing a spin-spin correlation, which is for each spin i, I'm looking at its value in configuration one times its value in configuration two. I sum over all spins and I call this the overlap and I call this the q12, okay? So what does it mean, this overlap, in terms of uh, what the configurations look like? It means the following. If configuration one is strictly equal to configuration two, then the spin spin will be one divided by n. That function will be one, okay? So it means if configuration one and two look very much like each other, the spin configurations will be strongly correlated and it defines such that this number is one for pairs of configurations that really resemble each other. It means the overlap between those two configurations is large. Now if you go to the extreme limit where configuration one and two are completely different and correlated configurations, the, pair, the product of the spins will be plus one, minus one, you sum, you'll get zero. If you have uncorrelated configurations, the overlap is zero. Strongly correlated pairs of configuration, the overlap is one. Okay. That's the uh, one or zero for you know, similar configurations and zero otherwise. Okay, so that's the spirit of the overlap. You take pairs of configuration and you ask the question, do they look the same or not? So for spins, it was done uh, long ago. For liquid, it's a bit more tricky. So I'm going to define it and explain why the definition is more tricky. So imagine that you have liquid in uh, three dimensions, I give you a configuration of the liquid, I give you another configuration of the liquid, and you have to decide do they look the same or not when I compare the positions of the particles. So what I have then, I have the positions of the particle in configuration one, and I'm changing the notations, of course, from one to n, and in configuration two, I have the list of all the positions for all the particles between one and n, so, you know, This is configuration one. I have all the positions for all the particles in the box. This is configuration two. I have the position of all the particles in the box. And now I want to ask the question, is this configuration equivalent or very close to this one? And I need to construct a function which is between one and zero. So let me define it and then explain why it works. Uh, for some reason in my, uh, okay. 
let me try to say so yeah, oh, um, fuck. Uh, uh, R1 okay, R2 and I don't have enough space <laughs> so it's 1 over n sum over i and j times a function that I call ri minus rj divided by small a like this so that's the overlap between configuration one and two. So I need to put uh, one here and two here. And then I need to define my function w and then I stop for one minute. Okay, so what do I have? I have all the positions in configuration one, all the positions in configuration two, and I want to compare them. Okay, so let's do it like this. Imagine I take the arrows for, and I try to compare them and I say this is my configuration tool. So configuration tool is a range thing. I superpose them and I want to say are those two configurations equivalent? So equivalent in one sense, if I want the configurations to be strictly equal, it means this cross and this cross, they would be exactly at the same position because these are point particles, remember, the density field. So if I want to allow for a little bit of leeway and say, you know, this, this, and this, and this are about the same configurations, but maybe with some small thermal vibrations, I introduce that number A, which is, you know, some kind of tolerance to say, if these two particles are at the same position, plus and minus A, then I count them at the same position. And that number is just a parameter that we use. It's, it's a fraction of the particle diameter, if you wish which is to say if those two positions are nearly the same with some small acceptance, I count that function will be one, and then if that function is one, it's going to count a one in the overlap. And so if all the particles are within a distance A between one another in the two configurations, that function will be one for you know, many pairs, and one divided by N again. It's constructed in such a way that this is one for nearly identical configurations. And the nearly means I have introduced this geometric factor A, which is if the configurations are equal within you know, plus and minus A, that will contribute to one, and the sum of ones divided by N will give me one. On the other hand, if I have totally, again, uncorrelated uh, configurations, and so it means for many pairs, I will have particles at distance larger than A. If I go larger than A, that function will be zero. The sum of zero will be zero. And so this is constructed such that if I have uncorrelated uh, pairs of configurations, that function is zero. Okay. Okay, you can go over it yourself. You draw your symbols. Just believe me if I give you configurations that differ by just a little bit of thermal fluctuations, that number will give me one. If I give you independent configurations, the number will be zero in the same spirit of the overlap for spins. So that's uh, the definition. So for now, we just have a tool that I call the overlap, which is telling me if I take pairs, do they look like one another or do they look uncorrelated, and that number is between one and zero, so it has the right flavor for uh, another parameter. So why is the overlap good? Uh, a good other parameter. Okay. So let's think again about the uh, sequence of temperatures that we had uh, earlier. So we said at high temperatures, the system can freely explore many, many liquid states. If I take two configurations, is this gigantic liquid uh, basin, they will be, you know, on average, they will be uncorrelated. And so at very high temperature, the overlap between independently chosen pairs of configurations will be zero. 
Now I move to this intermediate phase where the uh, configuration space is broken into this large number of states. And now I haven't said that the uh, copies of the systems were strongly coupled. I'm just saying I take pairs of configuration from the Boltzmann distribution. So now this is my configuration space. I've told you that I have exponential n times sigma pockets and I need to take two guys randomly in this configuration space. So if I take one guy in one pocket, the probability that it falls into the same pocket, the same guy, is one divided by exponent, so it's zero. Okay. It means if I take two randomly chosen equilibrium configuration in this uh, exponentially large number of states, typically they will fall into different states, and again, in between TD and TK, where the large number of states dominates the structure, typically the overlap will be zero. So it, it's zero above TD. It keeps to be zero between TD and TK. And so we need to think now what's happening when I no longer have this large number of metastable states. I have a very small number, meaning if I take two equilibrium configurations, very likely with a finite probability, they fall into the same glass pocket and the overlap is non-zero, okay? So the overlap, in a sense, is a way to probe the complexity of the landscape. If I have very many states, I take two configurations, they look different. If I have a very small number of states dominating the partition function, I take two configurations, they are the same, actually. Okay? So this is why, so Q will be zero for T larger than TK, because there are so many states to explore, and in the ideal glass phase, it's going to be close to one for temperature t below tk because I don't have this complexity anymore because the complexity has vanished. Okay. So this is why that overlap uh, thing is a good, and I'll show you why in a minute again, and that can be quantified, but intuitively I hope I convinced you that if I have this large number of states, the overlap is zero. And as soon as the uh, Boltzmann measure is you know, uh, highly concentrated on just a few states, the probability that pairs of configuration are the same becomes finite and the overlap serves as another parameter to detect that I have crossed a phase transition. So that's the uh, physical intuition behind, behind this. Maybe to connect with one of the questions or the entire discussions we had about uh, density, density, correlation function, the pair correlation function being boring, etc. So, so why is it that you know the entropy decreases and you see nothing in your liquid, it seems? I'll show you that there is something to be seen, but it's hard to see by the eye. It means it, it's not really in the structure of the packings that the order or the configurational entropy decrease can be seen. If I give you pairs of configurations at arbitrarily low, low temperatures, they all look like disordered states. If you look at pair, pair, you know, density, density correlation, in each of those configurations, it's boring, it's homogeneous and disordered, and it's looking like a liquid. The only way you can see that the liquid has very few states available, so few states that you know, it cannot go anywhere, is you take one configuration, it's boring, you take another configuration, it's boring, but then you superpose them and you realize, oh, they are the same, okay? And so to realize that you are really close to this phase transition, you need to compare pairs of configurations, and then you realize that the system is so highly constrained because there are so few states to be explored that it has to adopt the same types of density profiles because the number of possible solutions is so low that two pairs of configuration look really like each other. But if I give you one, it's boring. Just by comparing two that you realize that they match. And if you do pairs of configurations at high temperature, they are boring, boring, but they look very different. Okay, so that's why the overlap uh, uh, is a useful tool to reveal the complexity, even though each configuration individually doesn't tell you the result of that calculation. So this is why I think uh, the complexity of that phase transition. You look at configuration, you see really nothing, and yet the system is glassy, but to reveal the complexity, you look at pairs of configurations. So that's the intuition behind the definition of the glass order parameter. Okay. 
let's keep moving. I want to go to the nature and, you know, is it first order, second order, everything. So the final thing I do with the mean field is something called, and maybe you will start to understand that there is a name that comes back quite frequently in that business. Okay, so I'll introduce something that's called the France Parisi potential, and that goes from a paper by C.G. of France and Giorgio Parisi, and it's a physical review letters, uh, maybe 1997, something <coughs> like this. Okay, so they wanted to reformulate in a sense, I don't exactly know what they wanted to do, but that's how I see it now. They wanted to re-express again this phase, this sequence of phase transitions for the base spin model that had been understood at the time. So that's already 10 years after those papers uh, about the base spin model had been published. But that was a useful and practical way to reinterpret and re-express and maybe simplify our thinking about the nature of you know, the dynamic and the static phase transition in those models. And the analogy that maybe I want to use and I like to use is when you study phase transitions, you study the Ising model or you study the liquid gas, uh, ta -ta -ta, and then you go to the next year and you want to understand, you know, uh, universality of phase transitions and everything. And this is when you learn about the Landau approach about phase transition, which is about I don't care about the macroscopic details. I'm going to care about the order parameter. It could be magnetization, density, whatever. Usually when you learn those things and the Landau approach for things, you call something the order parameter. I don't know, M. Okay? And then you devise these uh, Landau free energies to study the nature of phase transition. And you don't talk about microscopic models anymore. So typically what you do is you define, you know, a Landau free energy as a function of an order parameter, and that's it. You forget about the details of the system. And this is what, you know, uh, why Landau approach is so powerful. And you, I don't know, I'm just catching things. You discover that, you know, your free energy as a function of M, the order parameter, so it's not the number of replicas. You know, it has one minimum at high temperature, and maybe at low temperature it's going to be like this. And at the critical point, you have singularities, and then you do your uh, theories of phase transitions a la Lando. So th it's a little bit what France and Paris have done, but now, of course, they wanted to do it for the kinds of phase transitions that uh, we just uh, described. So it means the other parameter we need to use would be the overlap between pairs of configurations, and we need to express the free energy cost to have a given value of the order parameter, the overlap, and for reasons that I don't know, the Franz Parisi potential, which is the analog of that thing in the context of glaciers, it's really the free energy associated to the overlap, okay? So in the exact same spirit that you have a free energy to have the value of M, you have the free energy to have the value of Q, it's strictly equivalent, I think. Okay. So let me show you how it works and how it compares to the things that you've learned when you started to learn about phase transition in statistical physics or even before in you know thermodynamics. So how does it work for the Franz Parisi potential? Uh, so we have to, so I'm going to stick to my notations on my notebook uh, again. So we have to take pairs of configurations. I'm, I'm taking them one by one. So I take the first one and I call, you know, R0 the, the list of the positions of all the particles in the first configuration. So I have n particles, they all have positions uh, R0. So this is my first configuration and I call this the reference configuration. Okay, so I take this one from the Boltzmann distribution. So that's the first of the two configurations that I need to uh, study. So that's the first one, it's fixed forever. Now I take the second one, okay? And so this is the second configuration. And I call this guy Rn, so it's again the list of the n positions of the thing. 
And then I want to study the fluctuations of the statistical mechanics of the overlap. So I construct the overlap between the reference configuration and the second configurations by the formula that I just gave you uh, before. Okay. So the definition of the uh, uh, Franz Parisi potentials goes like this. So when I have this reference configuration, it's fixed. Okay. And this one evolves at temperature KBT. So this is the construction. You take one of your reference configuration and you look at how the second configuration evolves when you have some fluctuations around the reference configuration. So you look at the fluctuations of this. This one is fixed and this one is changing as KBT evolves and the system you know, explores the configuration space. So if this one is uh, fluctuating, then you have fluctuations of the overlap and you measure the fluctuations of the overlap. So that's the probability distribution function. Okay. So again, I'm just following what people do. What's the probability distribution function for the other parameter? It's directly related to the free energy and the connection between the two that I write with my note again. So the free energy, it's minus KBT divided by N times the log of the probability distribution function of my order parameter. And that's the definition of the free energy, if you wish. Another way of saying it is that P of Q is exponential minus beta NV, and it's related the probability to observe a given value to the value of the free energy. So that's just the same definition that you would have. So that definition doesn't depend on the fact that I'm working with the glass. That's the definition even in the context of the Landau free energy. So I have one more problem here. So I want to look at the fluctuations of that thing, but this thing is a source of quench disorder. So if I want to finish the calculation, this is the definition of the Franz Parisi uh, free energy. So it's, it's nothing but observing the fluctuations of my order parameter and the log of the probability distribution function is the free energy. It's working exactly the same here. If you observe your order parameter, it's fluctuations. When you are at high temperature, the order parameter is close to zero and the fluctuations are given by phi. When you are at very low temperature, the order parameter fluctuates near this and how you fluctuate depends on the value of the free energy. So this free energy dictates the value of the other parameter and its fluctuations. And that's true for the Franz Parisi potential. The only thing we have to do is we have to do an average over this reference configuration. So that's the construction that this guy decided to do. They said we will follow the recipe of ordinary phase transition to define and construct that object here. So I had a more formal definition, but who cares? No, maybe I'll write it. Okay. okay, so if I want to express mathematically what those averages mean, and again, it's just to, to have a big integral on the blackboard. So formally, and formally, I think I need more space, so. <laughs> uh, fuck. Uh, uh, let's see. I'll start from the left and I see if it fits. Okay, so what I need to do, remember, so I have the minus KBT divided by N is fine. I have an average of other reference configuration, so I need to start from this one. So the minus KBT divided by N, it's in front. Then I have this average of R0, so I just write it formally. You would say I do an average of all these things. This is weighted by the Boltzmann distribution for the reference configuration, and this is the partition function of that guy, if you wish. Whoops. So that's the definition of this overline. And then I have to put there the logarithm of the probability distribution. So what is it? So it's the log of the probability distribution of the fluctuations of the overlap. So it's dr n Boltzmann weight 
found that guy and I knew it would not fit, so I just erased those things. And then, how do you estimate a probability distribution function? It's the uh, average of delta q minus q r zero r n. Okay. So that's what it means. It's just like a, an unzipped version of the same equation. So that's how these people, Franz and Parisi, wrote the Franz Parisi potential. They said we need to compute, we need to look at the fluctuations of the log. we need to average over the thermal, we need to take the log because it's a free energy, and then we need to average over the disorder, and we need to divide by n, and that's giving us the free energy, and that's the Franz Parisi potential. Uh, and my sentence is finished. Yes, remember, I'm doing statistical physics here, so I know nothing about the dynamics. I'm just solving everything in the statics. I say this is the structure of my phase space. When you do statistical mechanics, you take the Boltzmann distribution of whatever the configuration space you have, and that's the result of the, I assume that I'm in equilibrium at all temperatures, and it means I'm not asking, is it doable in practice? I'm just saying, I assume thermal equilibrium. If I can be in equilibrium, this is what I'm going to get. This description would still be valid when we are already in a glassy phase. I don't understand the question. I'm just telling you, when you do a statistical mechanism, I give you the Ising model and you can solve it exactly. You're not asking where you are, just solve it and you find the phases. And you say, if the temperature is here, I'm going into in that phase. If the temperature is lower, I'm going to be in another phase. This is what I'm doing here. I'm just assuming nothing. I'm just computing the properties of the system at different temperatures. And I discover phase transitions, assuming equilibrium. This is statistical mechanics. Yeah, I was just confused because if one of these phases is a glass phase, then we don't have equilibrium, right? No. Again, I'm assuming equilibrium all the way, and so what I'm trying to describe, in a sense, is the equilibrium property of an equilibrium glassy phase, if that thing would exist. And again, I'm not asking practical questions about, can I do it in practice? Can I be and remain in equilibrium that phase? What these calculations are telling me is that if I could because you know, I'm God, I can be in equilibrium in any temperature for that phase spin model, you would discover that below TK, you are in equilibrium in a glass phase. Glass phase being characterized by a non-zero value of this overlap parameter. That's what it means. Independently of any practical considerations of can you do it, you can't. But I can do the calculation, I can do it explicitly from beginning to end, assuming equilibrium all the way down to t plus to zero. Thanks. Okay. Oof. Uh, so it's, it's an average of that, so that average is an average of the log. So the, that's why the other line was of that quantity, okay? So the reason I wanted to, maybe that's a good excuse to say it. So, so this R0, I, I mean, the way I constructed it, I said R0 is God given, it's my reference configuration, it's frozen. Now I look at the, the fluctuations of the second configurations in the presence of this frozen configuration. So somewhere here, this is why I wrote this equation. You have a source of quench disorder, so I started from you know, a Hamiltonian from my liquid that had only, you know, linear jones pair interactions, say nothing like quench disorder. In that Franz Parisi construction, I reintroduce quench disorder in the problem. This is a problem with quench disorder, okay, first of all. So it, there is something, so I need to average over disorder, but the quantity that I want is the log of a quantity in the presence of a quench disorder. So. For those of you who've heard about you know, a system with quench disorder, 
doing a disorder average of the log of a quantity is kind of a nightmare, and this is the nightmare that people had faced 20 years before to understand and solve the statistical mechanical properties of spin glasses, the, param the paradigmatic system with quench disorder, and this is where the problems arise. You want to do a disorder average of a log, it's a nightmare, so you don't do it, you do a replica instead, ta -ta -ta. so if you want to solve that thing and you want to compute the quantities, you have to go back and learn replica calculations invented to treat quench disorder, because you're transforming your problem of a simple liquid without quench disorder by this coupling to another thing, you're transforming it back into a problem which quench disorder you, and averaging about the disorder of the log, it's mathematically complicated and it has to be handled with replica, okay? So this is where, again, replica calculations that were deployed and invented for spin glasses, they reappear again in the context of supercooled liquids because you understand now that the quantities you want to compute, in a sense, they can be rephrased with, as a problem in the presence of a quench disorder, and this is, what this paper of Hans Paris is about is try to understand how to do that calculation. Again, in the context of the P-spin model, it's, it's a relatively easy or doable calculation. You can uh, make these cal replica calculations and they did it and this is what they published. So you have, you know, you do these hard calculations and you get expression for your free energy at the end of the day and I guess I'll finish uh, there for today. So what do you find if you study the Franz Parisi potential? For, again, my favorite spherical P-spin model that I showed you before, and we'll go over the sequence of, you know, uh, temperature and phase transition that we've uh, discussed so many times today. So you do that calculation, you plot the result of these uh, lengthy calculations at high temperature, and you find something like this, you find that, you know, at high temperature, nothing dramatic happened to my free energy. It's characterized by a single minimum, and that minimum happens for low values of Q, so we knew, or we had guessed, at high temperature, it takes pairs of configuration, it's dominated by a minimum near Q equals to zero. Fine. Now you start decreasing the temperature, and the first temperature will hit is the uh, dynamic transition. So what's happening when the dynamic transition is cross is, I'm just trying to do it. This is the shape of the Franz Parisi potential when the dynamic transition happens. Meaning if you had a temperature just above this, you would see some kind of non-convexity but nothing dramatic. But then you approach TD and what you have is you have an inflection point that uh, develops here. So that's crossing TD. This is where the system, remember, is losing uh, air codicity in the dynamics. This is where uh, a large number of metastable states appear. So how does the system look like if I go below, say in blue now? So I go below TD and so what the system is developing at intermediate temperature where it's complex is developing a secondary minimum here. Okay, and I keep, I keep um, uh, decreasing the temperature and you see what's going to happen already. At temperature TK, I don't know what color to use. This secondary minimum will become similar to the glass minimum and that's the TK for you, okay? So for those of you who remember the classes about uh, you know, Landau phase transition, I drew the sketch of what's happening across the second order phase transition. You have a single minimum that gradually becomes two and it's continuous. That's not quite the same picture. What you have here is a secondary minimum that develops already above the phase transition, but that secondary minimum, it's metastable with respect to the uh, equilibrium one. So what you have here is the emergence of a metastable state. So remember what does it mean? It means that if I follow that state that appears, it's metastable, 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 and then suddenly it's becoming the stable state. So if I you know, try to push and increase the speed of what I'm trying to say uh, today, if you look at the average value of the overlap, it's dominated by the liquid close to zero, down to TK while it's jumping discontinuously there. 
So as a function of the temperature, the other parameter would be zero. And then it would jump discontinuously to the classy phase. So this is finally the answer to all of this. So this is the other parameter I told you. We hand waved, you know, we said it should be zero, but there are many states and should be finite. You do the calculation, it happens exactly. And the way it happens is by jumping discontinuously here. Okay? The last thing I want to say is then let's think about this uh, state at high Q. We said the state at half Q is going to be the equilibrium state at low temperature. So this is the glass. The glass has a finite Q because the glass is where you only have a few pairs of states. So it, one way to think about the uh, regime between TD and TK where you have the secondary minimum is to think of I have the liquid, okay, I have the glass, Okay, just as I have the glass and I have the liquid. So the liquid now I know, I can say it's the system that has zero overlap between pairs of configuration and the glass is the system that has finite overlap between pairs, okay? So what we learn then is that the glassy phase as we approach TK, it's, it's there at large Q, but it's only metastable and suddenly it's becoming the stable state. So what we have is we have some kind of first order transition, right? And so an interesting quantity in that, uh, in that diagram is the free energy difference between the equilibrium liquid and the metastable glass. So we have that free energy difference. Uh, so let me call it delta V, which is V of Q glass, if you wish, minus V of Q liquid, so that thing is almost zero, that thing is finite, so that's the arrow that I drew here, and again, it's a result of the calculation, that thing is nothing but the complexity we defined before. So what does it mean? It means the reason why the glass is only metastable, again, it's the result of this exponential number of states, and when this exponential number of states goes continuously to zero at TK, the glass finally wins, okay? So it means Again, in terms of that complexity that we had before, remember, it was like this, and that was my TD, that's temperature. So I'm just summarizing once more what we've been saying for one, uh, one hour and a half about this. We have the high temperature liquids, boring, no rugged landscape. In between TD and TK, we have this rugged free energy landscape. We have a finite complexity that maintains the system in the liquid phase from the point of view of the thermodynamics. And the reason why we have a liquid is because the glass is only metastable with respect to the uh, liquid. And finally, we go to TK, the glass wins because the complexity vanishes and goes to zero at TK here. So I'm just, <coughs> again, putting everything together. Maybe to put really, really everything together, I could put the uh, relaxation time of that system and what we saw yesterday is that if I compute the dynamics and I follow the relaxation time of that system, I'm losing ergodicity right here. So this is what the dynamics is doing. So that's what we did yesterday. So today we did this and we discovered that the uh, other parameter, the overlap, is jumping discontinuously across the first order transition. Hey. Mm. Okay, so we'll probably restart from there tomorrow. So as you see, I mean, the way I've described that mean field picture of the phase transition, I've tried to use the language of the phase transitions that you knew. You know, that's looking like very much open, whatever. So in my office, I think I have uh, basic textbooks and statistical mechanics. I can open any one of them. I'll find the picture like this to describe the liquid gas, you know, first order phase transition. And this is the picture you would find to describe first order transition. So that's why we call it a random first order transition. So that's the name that people have used to describe the phase transition that you find in Minfield model. It has the flavor of a discontinuous transition, yet it knows about the presence of quench disorder. So it's a random first order transition, we call it. And so some of you working in the glass business have seen the acronym for that thing. It's called RFOT. Okay. 
And so that's the nature of this glass transition. And 30 seconds maybe to close a little bit with uh, how it started. I've told you, you study density functional theory, you study mean field spin glass model, you study liquids with the approximations I mentioned today. You study liquids in large dimensions, you study all these systems, even more abstract you know, models of interacting degrees of freedom plus frustrations. This is what you find in very many of those systems all the time. So it's a robust, big class of systems that have this uh, random first order phase transition. So in, that's why we believe it's an interesting, important, uh, that's why we talk about it in these lectures is that there are so many systems that display the kind of phase transitions, at least in these mean field settings that we have been uh, discussing. Thank you. So for the energy landscape uh, at a single temperature, there exist multiple minima. So when we calculate, how do you fix the reference configuration? Uh, okay, so when I take this, this is guy here. It, is it, there a special criteria to taking? Uh, sorry, I didn't understand really the question. Okay. What was the question? For energy, land, in the energy landscape diagram, uh, for a single temperature, there exist multiple minima. Yes. So I'm asking, the, uh, what is the criteria of taking this uh, reference configuration? Is oh, th that's easy. I take R zero at random. The only thing that I'm requesting is that R zero has been equilibrated at the correct temperature. That's all I'm asking. You know, R zero is just given by the Boltzmann distribution at temperature beta. In practice, it means in this regime where I have this large number of states, which is your question, R zero will be in one of them, but I don't put any constraint on it. It could be in any one of them. And by construction, then I take one of them at random. And what I'm asking is, what's the cost of bringing the second configuration close to this one? If I want, okay, thank you. I'm just uh, using this to re-explain everything. So, so the question we're asking with this V of Q is, do I have to pay something to have a large value of the overlap? And the question is yes. So I, I take my reference configuration in one of these very many states, as you are saying. It's in one of them. And now I'm asking, if I take a second one, does it want to be elsewhere or does it want to be closed? Does it want to be, you know, a Q equals to zero and explore the other states? Or does it want to have a large overlap with this one? And in the liquid, if I want to have a large overlap, I need to pay something. And what I have to pay is the entropic cost of not exploring the other states. I need to stay there to have a large value. And because I have so many other states to go and visit, if I want to stay to, next to this guy, you know, I don't like it because I'm, I, I can't explore the other states. But in the liquid where the system can freely explore, it's going to go elsewhere. So if I suppose want to do this numerically, uh, is the disorder average uh, necessary? Suppose I just take one realization of R0, uh, do I still get the same picture or? Uh, Indeed, it is necessary. It is necessary, it only is you get it after the disorder realization. Uh, yes, yeah, so I, I plan to discuss this in the okay. lecture related to what do you measure in atomistic simulation, so you anticipated uh, some lectures ahead already, but I, I can give you this. And the reason is, so I put the word random here just to say, oh, it, it's a random system, fine. But no, actually, I mean, the sample, sample to fluctuation contribution to the thermodynamics <coughs> are really crucial. So just as yesterday, you were not there, but in the questions, I talked a little bit about, you know, the random field ising model versus the ising model in the presence of quench disorder or not. We know, for those of you who have studied the physics of the random fieldizing model, the disorder is key. You need to think about the disorder averages. You need to think about the difference between average over thermal fluctuations and average over the quench disorder. You can define at fixed configurations, you know, sample to sample fluctuations due to disorder or fluctuations due to thermal. These things define different critical exponents. So it, it, you know, it's, it's a business, the disorder, to treat. And 
I, I say, oh, look, uh, there is crunch disorder, so you need replicas. But in the actual calculations and in all the measurements you do, you have to be careful not to confuse thermal fluctuations and disorder averages. And you have to be taking those things into account very carefully. Yes? Is there any time scale that one needs to wait in order to choose to exper uh, choose to configuration? Uh, you need to do like an another realization itself to get to another configuration. Uh, okay, so in principle, you have the answer, but I'll go through the reasoning with you. Okay, so we know everything already. So remember what we said, say you're in a deeply supercooled liquid trying to approach the Kaltzman transition and the glass is uh, metastable with respect to the liquid. So what I'll show how to do hopefully is how do you do in the simulations to explore those fluctuations and measure that thing. And numerically we have tools that I'm going to discuss in a minute. You're asking about an experiment. Can I see this in an experiment? So again, I, I can just stop thinking about glasses and I go back to my favorite uh, water example. I've told you water across zero Celsius is suddenly transforming into ice and this you agree, okay? So I think the question you're asking is I go at one Celsius, just, just above the transition towards the crystal, can I say experimentally that that thing is going to transform into a crystal when crossing zero Celsius? Do I see it? And how long do I have to wait to see it? Can you see it? The answer is a plain no, you can't. And that's the question you ask for the experiments about the overlap. If you want to see those fluctuations experimentally, can you do it? You can't, because just above the transition, what do you see in your system? You see that guy. And, and the reason you don't see a metastable state above the transition where you're in the stable one is because what is the probability to see the, uh, the other state, the metastable one? So you're at one Celsius, what's the probability to observe a crystal light in your system? It's a free energy difference. So in terms of a probability, that's one of the equations I wrote, the probability goes as what? It's exponential minus beta n times the free energy. So when n is 10 to the 23 and the free energy is finite, exponential of 10 to the 23, you can wait a very long time before seeing it. You can't. That's the reason why you don't see crystal at one Celsius, because the probability to observe this is infinitely small. Okay? So that's why I'm going to hopefully say it. In simulations, what do we have to do? We have to fight the exponential n factor and our tools in simulations to win against the exponential n. And it's well known in the context of uh, uh, phase transitions. You have to bias your measure and everything, but you're really trying to observe exponentially small fluctuations of your order of a meter. Because if you do, and you, again, to close my questions, if you look at the fluctuations of any thermodynamic quantity in a system, if the average of that thing is zero, and you look at the fluctuations experimentally, you know that you've learned how the fluctuation of a thermodynamic quantity looks like. It's sharply peaked around the average, and you know this is one of our square root m. So typically in a system, you see you know the, the average, a little bit of the fluctuations. When it's 10 to the 23, you see nothing. You just see one value, and it's really deep into the tail of that distribution, exponentially suppressed in n, that you would see that uh, thing. And this is what computer simulations are going to do. They are going to go 10 to the minus, you know. Uh, to observe these fluctuations and finally get back to the energy. So the answer is no, you can't see anything experimentally unless you have specific tools to see it. Uh, also, I had another question. Uh, yesterday you had mentioned about uh, gamma. So that E minus T, D. OK. So do these exponents follow any kind of scaling laws? <sighs> so you're asking about that exponent. Uh. And then? Uh, scaling, scaling laws, do they follow scaling laws, these exponents? Uh, um, I mean, just in the case of uh, Ising sort of, I mean, just... Uh, 
exponents, uh, there are inequality equalities uh, among critical uh, exponents. Uh, well, I haven't defined any specific exponent for those guys. It's all trivial for now, so that's the only one. So uh, scaling with what other okay, exponents? Okay. I haven't defined okay. any other exponents. I don't know what relation between different exponents okay. you would uh, look for because uh, I give you just one. So okay. that's it. Thanks. Probably we should uh, close it. I'm here if you want to ask me questions, I mean we, but we can go to lunch. Yeah. Thank you. He'll wait another two minutes or so. Okay, so 
Can you hear me well from the back? Okay, so let's start. Uh, all right. Uh, so uh, we, uh, I mean, I sort of like try to introduce the concept of first passage uh, survival probability uh, more on a um, formalism level, on a technical level. Uh, so we'll continue along that line. So the idea is, idea for today's lecture would be to understand first passage processes under resetting. We we'll try to work out some examples, and in particular, uh, uh, one of the main goals would be also to understand why and when resetting works. Okay. So. This would be the plan, more or less, uh, to cover this uh, this ideas. I mean, this these are the really the, the one of the main ideas which people have worked on in the last couple of years, and I would like to you know you know like uh, make you understand these concepts or ideas. Okay, so uh, let us rec recap what we did uh, yesterday. So I just assume that okay, just imagine some sort of a domain, okay, and. Uh, so generically, you just call this entire domain as D. And then there is a boundary through which the particles uh, can escape. And uh, this is the starting point. And let's say that you have some sort of random trajectory using which it can escape, right? And uh, for formal, uh, like notation-wise, so this is, uh, I call this T, this random time T, right? And the survival probability that the particle stays inside this domain up to time t, right, without being absorbed, that is, should be a function of time t up to which you are observing the process. And also, it should be a function of the initial condition. So let's just write it x0. Right. And then we also introduced a concept called first passage time. So because this time is random, so there is also a statistics involved with that. So this is the way we are going to define that guy. Right. All right. And also I told you that this FT is related to survival probability just by the negative derivative. Right? Okay. And so there is using this relation, we can uh, write rather a much more simpler relation in the Laplace space, right? This this is something which we derived, right? And what was it? So Remind me what was exact the form of it. So T, let's see. Yes, so it was T tilde S X naught Right, this one, right? Where this t tilde is is nothing but the Laplace transform of this. Okay, so if you just just to complete this part, so t tilde is is x naught is definition wise e to the power minus s t f t t x naught d t. Okay, just the Laplace transform of the first passage time distribution. Similarly, this is also the Laplace transform of this guy. Okay. Okay. We had we had all these definitions which we did uh, uh, yesterday, and now we are we will try to move on to the first passage process for a stochastic process, uh, which is undergoing many resetting jumps. Right. Okay. So to you know to simplify the problem it's always e or it's always you know like better to start from something simpler okay so we will just again focus on simple one dimension process okay so so how to uh, just imagine that you have is uh, some stochastic process okay x of t says t so it starts from 
starts from x naught okay and this is my resetting coordinate okay and this at, at the origin i have this absorbing boundary okay or the target so the moment this trajectory the particle the walker the agent whenever it comes here at this time whenever it comes the process stops okay and in every every realization it can come at some arbitrary time so that is the first passage time okay and we are looking at the first passage statistics of that time okay so let's draw some trajectory something like this and then you have this jump and eventually let's say that it gets absorbed here right and this is my t now because i have this resetting component right i have this resetting which is taking place with rate r so instead of writing capital t i will just write i will just add a r subscript okay and so you know like moving forward for each one of the case wherever i have a t i will just replace everything with a small t r right that's it it's just a notation and the aim is to understand how the statistics for the first passage probability or the survival probability they change when we add the resetting okay to do to do that you know like we'll use this concept of renewal right which we did yesterday remember this so let us also again uh, remind ourselves what we did so we had just a simple this picture right so it was an unconstrained boundary so we started from somewhere here and then we had resetting and then we had multiple resetting so we were looking at the position distribution of the particle right over here and there is no boundary okay so the particle actually can go anywhere so for this what we looked into is this last renewal time right and we in uh, and then the way we wrote it was pr xt yes xt given x not xr which in this case both of them i am assuming to be zero okay it doesn't really matter so this was written as to the power t e0 xt data something like that right and it had two components one component was that the trajectories which underwent resetting and then there was there were this multiple you know like there is a contribution from the other trajectories which which underwent at least one resetting event and possibly many right okay so when i did this right so there is one term okay there was a by default there is a default term which i didn't write it here but this this is a term which i wrote it actually when i solved the uh, master equation the day before so there is we assumed that whenever or wherever from the particle jumps right this x prime right so the, we didn't write that x, x prime term here explicitly right because the particle could jump from anywhere right and so this was normalized to one anyways so this is the reason i skip this part okay now we would like to do the same renewal approach we would like to introduce the same renewal approach for the for the survival probability okay so to do that so just keep this thing in mind and let me come here and to do this again we will try to think about the last renewal uh, last renewal approach or the last resetting time etc etc okay so let me also erase this part just keep that uh, renewal picture in mind okay okay
let's draw some again some many resetting events and let's say that there is a last resetting event okay so let's say this is my last resetting event okay after which i want the particle to be at this position x at time t okay and this is i define this as tau l as before okay so i'm essentially replicating this uh, that same schematic over here only with the difference that this is now my absorbing boundary so as soon as the particle comes here it will be absorbed right okay and the quantity which we are looking into is qr okay this is you see the survival probability here so qrt x not xr so this is essentially the survival probability that the particle has started from x not okay being reset at xr with a rate r okay and then it survives uh, up to time t okay this is what it is and so for this we would like to write the same renewal equation okay so now again we can see that there are two contributions right so there are two contributions there is one part of the trajectory is not one part of there is a collective trajectory so which didn't undergo any resetting events right so for that so again let's just write this guy as qr1 and qr2 right so what is qr1 in this case the, the, so the trajectories which didn't undergo any resetting events right so then it will be e to the power minus r t right and because they started from zero and came all the way till t right without having any resetting so this should be this should be the underlying process right because these are the trajectories which are not which have not seen any resetting events right so this is e to the power minus r t t x not just x not right clear okay and then we have the second term q r 2 right so again if i have to compute this term again note the following things right so i have multiple stuff right here so one thing is that from tau tau is my last re, uh, last resetting epoch right from here to here i didn't have any resetting right so i have to write that term so that is e to the power minus r t minus tau l right from here to here it underwent just the underlying process right without any resetting and what is the corresponding survival probability q right t minus tau l right and in this case where from the particle is starting xr right so this one right okay so we see that we have already reached here we have already reached here similar terms right and of course then there is a resetting exactly at r d right so this is r d tau l okay okay so far go so good right now there is a difference between this problem and that problem okay because you see that whenever i made these jumps doesn't matter whether the first resetting last resetting or whatever i have to ensure that the particle actually survived if the particle was already absorbed right then there was no point of making jumps right so i have to ensure this fact that the moment it made the last jump or whatever number of jumps it had every time it survived do you see the point so what is this pro probability that it survived right so let us maybe write, try to write exactly the way we wrote here right so it made the jump from arbitrary position in space right x prime but then we integrated over the entire phase space and we and we got one because the here there is no absorption the particle will always survive right so if we write the similar term over here so it should be so dx prime right and what is the probability that you will find the particle here 
So that is just simple, simply the propagator, right? The propagator which is basically sitting here, right? So P R X, what is this? Time, tau L, correct? And where from it started? X naught, and it possibly underwent many resetting events. Okay? And what is this integral? What should be the limit of this integral? Exactly, zero to infinity, because you have to main, ensure that the particle was in between, right? So this is zero to infinity, okay? And by definition, what is this? So this, you see that when there is no absorption, this is exactly one, right? But now because you have absorption, this cannot be one, right? So if you take a look at your note, so the way we defined survival probability, this was over the domain. I also even used it probably in the previous. Uh, so this is PR XT, it's not XR DX, right? So this, what we see that this is exactly the survival probability. So what does it mean? It essentially means that if I have to make a jump from here to here, I'm ensuring the fact that the particle survived here. Only then I will be able to make a jump. Clear? Okay. So this should be QR <coughs> tau L X naught <coughs> XR. Okay, so let us try to write this together, okay, all, all of this. So I can write, eventually putting all these uh, terms together. So QR, T, X naught, XR is the first term, e to the power minus R, T, Q, T, X naught, plus R, Okay. I hope you are able to see all the terms, right? These are all multiplied, right? And then, of course, there was an integral over d, t, d tau l from 0 to t. And then there is this final term, right, on which we spent like five, to five or six minutes. So this is qr t minus tau it's not xr, okay? So you don't worry about this one. It's basically when you put all the term together, uh, all the terms together, you will get this one. Okay. Okay. So now there is a difference between also again the probability distribution and this one, because you see that you want to calculate QR, right? And actually, eventually you ended up getting QR also on the right hand side, right? So obviously, if you have something structure like this, usual idea is to take a Laplace transform, okay, and try to extract QR. Okay. So this is something we can do. And so let's say that you multiply both sides. So for this kind of any kind of, you know, like you have these integral equations, try to identify the structure. You will see that always Laplace transform is a very useful way of handling this kind of equation. So you have QR T X naught XR, right? So if you apply e to the power minus ST on these sides, what it will become? Q. No, it cannot be just S, right? Because you have already R sitting there. So it should be R plus S, X naught, right? Then you have R. Then you see that this is one term and this is the other term. So this is again, it has a convolution form, right? So the convolution form looks something like this, right? So zero to T, let's say H tau, G T minus tau, D tau, right? So when you apply, something like this, what do you get? This is the convolution theorem, right? What do you get? So Laplace transform of HS, right, times G of S, right? So this is exactly what I'm going to use here, okay? So I have R, which is coming from here. Then into the, the Laplace transform of this entire thing, so that is Q tilde R plus S XR, 
times qr is x naught xr okay and this was also the term here qr is yeah okay so then you can take this guy over here right do this small algebra and what you get is the following so qr is So you see that the survival probability in the presence of resetting, okay? So what I have done is, is very simple, right? I have just taken out this guy over here, then it became one minus r times q, and then of course it went into denominator. So the bottom line here is that if you want to calculate the survival probability in the presence of resetting, that can be written in using some sort of a renewal formula in terms of the underlying process, okay? And where you see that it's, it's in the Laplace space because this formula in the real time was, you know, like a bit more convoluted. But in the Laplace space, it really becomes a simple formula, right? So again, like, like, like yesterday, right, I want you to, you know, like take a second and appreciate this particular relation. Because you see that the, the fact which I'm using here, right, is essentially the underlying process. So the survival probability of the underlying process comes to the light, right hand side. So whatever stochastic process you like, you again compute the survival probability of that process okay, within the same setup, but in the absence of resetting, right? Calculate the survival probability, put it in this renewal formula, and what you get is the survival probability in the presence of resetting. Okay? So this is the renewal structure. Yeah. Uh, last time uh, in that uh, Yes. There was Q of tau given x0. Which one? Yeah, this one. Uh, no, no, no. In the, in the first term. So when we, when, we, when we were doing probability, Yes. and you changed variables, Yes. it had become Q of t given x0 uh, instead of xr. That Are is you sure this is uh, xr and not x0? Which one? This one? Yeah. Let's take a look into this one. No? So e to the power minus this uh, no it should be xr sure yeah because it okay. is starting from here yeah so this is q this one you are talking about right yeah yeah okay okay so uh this, so this is the renewal formula for survival probability So you can similarly, you can use this other relation, right? The relation between the survival and the first passage. And then can try to write also the survival probability in the presence of resetting in terms of the, in terms of the first passage distribution in the Laplace space, okay, uh, without resetting. So, you know, like these are like, uh, you know, just playing with these relations, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so, what is the aim of the, pro like the main aim here is to calculate the time it takes for this particular trajectory to reach here, right? So that was the quantity, which is the mean first passage time, right? So the mean first passage time, this is given in terms of, so if T R, this one, right? And if you remember uh, from yesterday's note, we showed that this is actually QR, right? S is equal to zero, given X naught XR. Do you remember this one? Probably you don't, it's fine. Okay, 
So if you do that, so you can see that now I can put s is equal to 0 here, right? I can put s is equal to 0 here and here. So I get a relation T of R average. This is given in terms of Q R XR. So now from survival probability, right, we now we are able to write an equation formula for the mean first passage time. Okay. So similarly, if you take if you want to calculate the second moment, let's say, okay, for the second moment you can again write d square f this one, do bipers, okay, then you will again get a relation in terms of the survival probability. Okay. I so I want you to check what is the form of T R square. Okay. What is the form of T R square? in terms of the underlying process, okay? The survival probability of the underlying process, okay? So there is also, you know, like uh, this is, as I said, this is in terms of the survival probability, and we already have, we already know that the survival probability is uh, connected to the first passage time distribution using this simple Laplace transform, right? Uh, so this is, let's say this one, this was one minus S, Q R. It actually doesn't matter whether I write R or not. But, uh, so you can use this relation and just simply rewrite this one in terms of the first passage, the Laplace transform of the first passage distribution. So this should look like something like this. Okay. So these formulas are. Uh, I should stress uh, stress that these all these formulas are essentially identical. Okay. It doesn't matter whether you use this one or this one. Eventually, all of them will give the same results. And as you can see that the using survival probability and first passage is essentially the same, right? Because they are just related to each other by the simple relation. So this is R X R. This should be X R. Okay. Okay. So this was the general relation. This and it, this R doesn't really matter, right? Because this is true for any general first passage process. Okay, so I, I think, you know, like we did like a lot of formalism, this, that, and all, right? Maybe it's time to do an example, okay? So if we do an example, I think we will really able to see the effect of resetting, okay? Yeah, two questions, yes. So this form of independent of, you, you don't need resetting, right? No, not at all. So this is what uh, I showed, like uh, told you yesterday, right? Yeah. So then in that formula of mean TR that we have, we yes. have QR. Yes. And Q tilde zero. Yes. Without the resetting is just the mean first passage time without. Resetting. Right. That is also true. So then we can already compare the two. No, to but see. this is not R is equal to zero, right? Yeah. But if we know the form of that, we can already see. Form of what? If we know the form of Q tilde. Yes. You need to know the form of Q tilde, right? But you need to know the entire form of the Q tilde. That is also one point, right? To understand, uh, to calculate the mean first passage time, it is not enough that you know the mean first passage time for the underlying process. It's not enough. You need the entire survival probability or the first passage. You need the entire distribution, okay? Only then you can use these relations, okay? Only then it will make sense. Okay, so let us now uh, do an example of diffusion. So let's look into our, you know, like favorite example of diffusion with resetting. Yeah, one second. Yeah. I couldn't hear it. Yeah. It's not obvious why the denominator will always be positive. This one? Yeah. Because why? you have because this is a survival probability, right? Survival no, no, probability is less than one. Uh, yeah, yeah, but the R factor, uh, I mean, it's not so obvious. So R is how also a positive number. So this guy always has to be less than one. Uh, that is what you are asking, right? Yeah, yeah. is it yeah. obvious that the product? Yeah, by is? definition. If you look, think about the survival probability, right? So survival probability is less than equals to one. Now you are taking a Laplace, Laplace transform of that one. And then you, this, you also have to use the fact that R is always greater than zero. So if you use that, then the, you, will, you will be able to show that this guy is always, this entire term is always positive. Okay. Okay. 
Okay. So now just in, let us imagine that uh, we are looking into the diffusion diffusive process, right? So I have origin where I have the target. Right, I start from here, I have a couple of resetting events, and eventually I reach here, right? And this is my T of R. And this is what I would like to calculate, right? So to do that, I will, I will try to use this formula, okay? So if I have to use this formula, I need to know the survival probability for the underlying process, which is essentially the classic problem of simple diffusion pro process without any resetting and in the presence of just a target, right? So this is what I should find. We are starting from somewhere. It's just a simple diffusion process and it reaches here, right? So this is what I would like to find. And this is something I will not work out here. This is something I think most of you guys probably have worked out at some point of time. But I will just sketch out the derivation. So, so for, to do that, you need, the, you need again like the survival probability for the underlying process, right? QT, it's a starting from X naught, right? This is given in terms of the propagator, right? This is for the R is equal to zero case now, right? Because we need Q, which is basically the resetting free process, correct? So if you use this one, where this P of XT is essentially the probability distribution in the presence of absorbing boundary at zero, right? This is a very old result, by the way, okay? I think uh, most of you guys should know. I mean, and you can, uh, instead of solving it using a differential equation or something like that, you can use the method of images and also can solve it. And if you solve this, what you will get is something called error function. So if you don't know this, maybe you can take a look into this uh, review of modern physics by Chandrasekhar or maybe, you know, take a look into C. Redner's book. So either C. Redner's book on first passage or okay. So you can take a look into this, uh, these references, okay? Okay, so you have, you know, like you have this thing, right? <coughs> and of course, from here you can e immediately calculate the, the Laplace transform of the survival probability. So if you do that, what you get is the following. Okay, which is essentially the survival probability of this one. Okay. And then, of course, this is the resetting fee process, which is basically the underlying process. And you can calculate this kind of survival probability for any kind of stochastic process, not always, but for many cases, you can exactly solve this guy, okay? Not only also related to diffusion, you can also think beyond diffusion, diffusive processes, okay? So now once we have this, so we can just now plug this, relation, plug this formula into this relation, right? Into this one, right? So this is, I have Q tilde S, this has Q tilde R, right? So I can do this. And now also for the sake of simplicity, let us also assume that X naught and X R are at the same point, okay? So let's just assume X R is equal to X naught, okay? And do, let's do the following. So, so, so x naught, and just use this relation. Just, just one second. Let me just finish this. Huh? So, what you get? Okay. Yeah. So this one, yes, right. But you need to solve this probability distribution in the presence of the absorbing boundary at zero, okay? So it basically will be uh, one Gaussian solution minus the uh, Gaussian solution coming from, the, from his uh, image, okay? This is something which is very well known in the literature, okay? Okay, so once we plugged in this, this formula over here, we got the mean first passage time 
okay for diffusion under stochastic resetting okay so now if you if you think about it the first thing you do is essentially you make a plot right you want to see how it looks like okay so there is one piece of information actually i didn't tell you okay so maybe let us first make that discussion you see that you can calculate the survival probability right we have calculated the survival probability for the diffusion process in the absence of resetting right now if i calculate the the first passage time so if i calculate the first passage time which is minus del q del t right so it will look it will look like something you will have this form so zero okay it has this form so it's a normalized distribution okay very well normalized distribution but it so happens that it has actually power law tail okay at large time okay you see this t to the power minus 3 by 2 right because of this so the first passage mean first passage time this essentially becomes infinity so this is diverging okay so r is equal to zero case we already know that if you are looking at a diffusive search process the process is extremely inefficient because the mean time towards the target is essentially infinite okay so now what we did is we did all this you know like we added resetting etc etc and now we have this formula and now we would like to see how it behaves right as a function of resetting rate okay so for r is equal to 0 when r is very small so again you know that you are going to the original process itself right so then you know that it should be diverging right so it should have very high value right okay now if you think about the other limit other extreme limit let's say r is very high okay so the resetting rate is very high okay so let's just take a look into this one right you had this resetting so if resetting rate is very high what does it mean sorry so it basically says that you are doing the reset resetting events so frequently the particle essentially stay stays very close to this point right and also it doesn't really you know like go very far beyond this point right there is a region where it is re getting reset right so it essentially stays very close to this xr right so it also takes a very long time for the trajectory to come beyond that that domain and reach essentially the origin so that time also should be exceedingly large right so for large r also i should have feel something very high right and now if you extrapolate this what you get is something like this okay so you see that there in between there is a finite rate okay finite is there is a state of finite resetting rate for which this mean time okay in the presence of resetting that becomes that becomes finite okay so this is the first lesson you learn when we you know like when you start uh, learning uh, stochastic resetting so you have an underlying diffusive search process which had a infinite mean first passage time but you introduced this resetting rate and as you change the resetting rate you see suddenly there is a finite mean first passage time emerging okay that's one thing second you also notice that there is also an optimal rate okay what this mean time essentially becomes it has the minimum point right okay so one can actually try to compute this guy this r star okay so you can try to compute this guy you compute this guy what you get is approximately you can show that there is of course you know like the the solution is not really exact i mean you you are you get usually a transcendental equation which you have to solve to get r star but typically this goes as this so 2.53 is not really important then you have d by x r square okay so this is an optimal rate at which if you conduct the process okay so you'll see that you can act globally optimize them in first passage time okay 
And of course, if you look into a different process, et cetera, et cetera, of course, this value will change, right? It will, it's a clearly a process-dependent rate, right? And of course, you have also exhausted your entire, you know, like uh, the entire dynamics because you have done the optimization. So it, this optimization actually knows, has all the information about on the, all the underlying parameters, correct? Yeah, so this is, I think, this is the first thing we learned. And uh, there is also another important point which I would like to make here. You see that, which is regarding this first passage time distribution, okay? So you see the first passage time distribution, we had this form, right, for the underlying process, which had, just, just one second, I will take the question, which had this power law time, right? And now what we, we, show, we, we saw that the, it had a, you know, infinite diverging mean. When added resetting, we saw that the moment actually became finite, right? Now, obviously, the next question would be, can I think about the form of this? Okay, okay. Can I calculate the, the distribution function, okay, for the first passage time itself, okay, in the presence of resetting, okay? Because I saw that there is a paradigm shift, right? From infinite, it became finite value. So I would be interested in knowing at least, if not the exact distribution, at least the tails. Like how at large, ti large time, how it behaves, right? So that suddenly the, the, not only the first moment, you can calculate also the second moment, higher order moments, you will see everything become finite, okay? So what is now happening to this tail, okay? So maybe you can ask the question, yes. Uh, Sir, so, uh, like the average of TR, we calculated uh, uh, assuming that X naught equals XR, right? Right, right, right. Uh, but then the argument you said when uh, when resetting rate is too high and you get stuck in the in a band near to XR. Right, the resetting uh, location. Uh, but that kind of doesn't uh, apply because my XR is X naught as well because so, so, so no matter how R high high R is. Yes. So even if I'm stuck in that band, I'm getting absorbed. So no, uh, the X naught was the initial condition. Uh, X naught was the initial position, and right. zero is the Origin is the target. Oh, excellent. Okay, okay, okay. Right. Yeah. Sorry. Okay. Yeah. No problem. Okay. So this is something which I cannot really prove here. Okay. Yeah. Uh, if uh, XR is zero, say. So you are and, uh, start basically you are resetting to the uh, to the target itself. Okay. So that's uh, right. I mean, it's not like possible that they are like really close by. I mean, in principle, you can do that. Huh. So yeah. that won't have any effects on of, the R. Of course, you can you can see that, that right? Like here, if you can just take XR to be very close to the target point. Yes. On that, uh, the point is that it's for finite XR, what is happening? <laughs> that is the interesting regime, right? I mean, is it at the point where it started? If you're, if you're sort of like resetting very close to the target point itself, right? Yeah. So then, you know, like you have already sort of biased your system towards the uh, success, yes. If uh, the absorbing boundary is not at zero, yes. then this formula would be XR minus X absorbing whole Some, square? Something like that. You will have a L, right? So the, yeah. there is a relevant uh, length scale which will come, L minus X naught or something like that. Okay, so uh, I will just give you this result, okay? So this, it so happens that it actually becomes an exponential function at large time, okay? And of course, this prefactor, et cetera, will depend on all the system parameters, like resetting rate, di diffusion constant, and et cetera. Okay. So this is the reason. So you have a complete paradigm shift from the power law tail to exponential tail. Okay. And that is the reason, at least for this kind of this diffusion process, you can actually see the convergence of all the moments. Yeah. So uh, that f figure that you draw, like that uh, variation of TR mean, with R, yes. so is it valid only for the 1D translational diffusion or does it also hold in the rotational diffusion? So, so. if this, this particular plot I made yeah. in with reference to this expression, right? Okay. If you take a rotational diffusion, you will get a similar kind of expression, right? Yeah, but uh, like if I consider a circle, yeah, a okay. in a circle, so if I'm resetting it to some location, say theta R, Right, in some angular position, and there is some target theta t. Okay. Say. So there might be different ways of approaching the theta t. Sure. So but this is approaching is again through diffusion itself, no? 
Yeah, but uh, that R, that minima that you observed, yes. might be one or more, right? So it can, of course, it will depend on the system. Yes. Of course, yes. Okay, then I mean, this is only particular. So depending on what the underlying motion is, yes, yes. Uh, this minima can differ from. Of course, this way. minimum, what I wrote here, this was very particular to this given expression. Of course, if you take something like this, mm -hmm. so in your case, your instead of having x to be your random variable, so your theta will be the random variable, right? So theta is basically doing diffusion, and then you reset to a particular theta naught. And then you want to reach some theta, theta final or something. Right? There can be multiple minima also, right? Like that, in that case, that that's, that is an uh, that is a question we we don't have really a straightforward answer. Okay, there could be many different situ situations. Okay, mm. and I will try to get to some of these questions today. Okay, okay. thank you. Okay, so this is an uh, this is a, this is the piece of information which I wanted to give you. Okay, so now. Uh, what we saw that in this kind of problem, at least in the case of diffusion, we saw that it had a diverging mean, mean right? And we, as soon as we added the resetting rate, it doesn't matter, right? You see that even if, if it was, R was very close to the zero, even then it became finite, right? So it seems that as soon as you introduce resetting, it became finite, right? So we would like to also understand this, uh, you know, like this uh, aspect of, you know, adding a small resetting rate to the, to the underlying process, okay? This is something we would like to understand, okay? So, so the best thing would be to start with, again, with an example, okay? So let us, uh, can I erase this entire board now? Sir? Yeah. Uh, what would happen to the uh, most probable uh, TR? So wh wh what do you mean the most probable TR? Like uh, you mean the, the, this TR itself? But that is not uh, not the most, uh, in a sense, like P of TR will have a maximum, I mean, highest probability somewhere, right? So this, yeah, so, okay, so this, yeah, yeah, that's a good question. You mean from here, right? Yeah. So you will be able to show that actually this goes something like this. It's an exponential tail, okay, and then there is a peak somewhere, yeah. So this is a good question. I, uh, I don't really recall at this point of time how it goes, et cetera, like what is the most probable, like the median, median. Yeah, sorry? Uh, I think there might be just maybe one or one pa one paper where they have probably discussed this point. Yes, but not from the. I mean, they didn't calculate the entire distribution, but uh, they have calculated it fr from a different perspective. Yeah, I can give you the reference. Okay. Okay, so I will just erase this uh, the entire board now and I want to go to an another example. So in the previous problem, we had just a diffusing particle, right? And then it was in the presence of a target. Okay. So now imagine that the particle is starting from somewhere here. Okay. It has a diffusion, but on top of that, there is also a drift towards the boundary. Okay. So imagine that you have an additional drift, right? Okay, for the underlying process. And now you have this resetting which is taking place, right? Something like this. And eventually it will reach here, right? Okay. The problem is clear. So instead of having a diffusion, you have a process uh, which has a drift towards the target, right? So now if you think about it, right? Because you have a drift towards the target, right? So you always will have a finite mean first passage time, right? for the underlying process. And then you can calculate that time, okay? So it will become x0 by lambda, okay? Lambda being the drift, drift velocity and x0 being the distance, okay? So now the question is the process itself is doing very well, right? Because it has a finite time anyway to reach the target. The question is why do we, you know, like need to add resetting, okay? This is the question, okay? And whether resetting is going to be useful at all because the process is anyway being completed quite efficiently with the underlying process, right? With the underlying mechanism, 
Okay? So in this case, I'm not going to calculate the survival probability for the underlying process, et cetera, but I'm just going to give you the expression for that. So this is something which you can find again in Redner's book. So the, the form of the survival probability or uh, the, the first passage, so this actually has this form. This is lambda square, okay? So now, now you know the drill, right? You have this renewal formula. Now you, you just substitute this guy over there, right? Once you substitute this guy, what you get is something like this. So TR, this by R, And of course, you can verify that when r is equal to r going to zero limit, you get back this one. Okay. Clear? Nothing. It's just a bookkeeping calculation. I just use this expression and put it in uh, the renewal relations we have, right? And got this guy. Now, what I want to do, I want to make a plot of this guy as a function of resetting rate, right? And what is the crucial difference between this process and the diffusion process? Here, we are starting from a finite value, right? Okay, so it so happens, so if I, if I just choose some parameter values, okay, it doesn't really matter like what is this particular choice. If you just do this and put it in the, just make this plot in Mathematica or MATLAB or something, if you just, just by choice, this is an arbitrary choice, you don't need to care about it, okay? Then what I do is I make first, let's say, tier versus R, Okay, and now the, open, the only parameter I have in the system is lambda, right? So I will basically vary lambda, okay? And then of course, this is, this is the R, okay? So you see that I get a plot like this, okay? So this is, let's say this is for lambda is equal to two, okay? Some arbitrary values of lambda, okay? So R is equal to zero, you start from a finite value, right? And then you add resetting, and what you see that it monotonically increases. Okay. So it, it is very clear that in this case, of course, resetting is not really useful, right? So the process was actually doing very well by default, but when you added resetting, it just basically prolonged the completion, right? This is what it did, okay? Now, of course, you know, like, uh, because I am sort of motivated by this diffusion ex example, right? So I would like to play around with more lambdas and would like to see how it goes. Okay. And now suddenly I take some another value of lambda and I see something like this. Okay. So I see that, that by choosing different parameter values, parameters means the drift velocities, okay, I have created two scenarios. In one case, by introducing resetting, you're just seeing that it, ha it has a monotonic increase. On the other case, you have first a monotonic decrease and then it increases, right? So in this case, you know, like we see the same behavior as we have seen in the case of diffusion. Meaning that with the resetting, added resetting, I have seen a decrease in the mean first passage time. So there is a bit of search efficiency I have gained, right? By introducing resetting in this particular case. Right, is it clear? Like, okay. So there are a few things which I would, uh, sort of like try to uh, emphasize here, right? So what we have seen, uh, yeah. Yes. Yes, of course. It will also depend on diffusion cost. In this particular case, I have choos chosen D is equal to half and X not equal to one. So instead of that, you could have chosen, you could have chosen fixed lambda, okay? Some fixed lambda and then varied D and varied x naught, okay? So you see that there is quite some arbitrariness, it seems, right? And then by doing this arbitrariness, I can sort of like gain, you know, either I can gain some efficiency or I can lose it, right? So resetting can be both, you know, like beneficial or it can be detrimental. This is what I'm getting, right? Yeah. So, 
so then the, then the question comes that you know like this is sort of like taking us towards this broader question right so even within one system so in the case of diffusion i say that you add a bit of resetting it doesn't matter it will always be helpful in this particular case drip diffusion process we see that there can be two scenarios right in one case in within one system you have two different scenarios okay so what is going on right and we can we basically comment on something general okay for arbitrary stochastic process right that is the main goal another thing is so this is something you know like uh, something you would, you would probably like you see that what is this mean uh, you know, not mean the optimal resetting rate in this case and in this case okay so what is the optimal resetting rate in this case zero right so this is the optimal resetting rate in this case is zero, right? And what is the optimal resetting rate in this case? It is non-zero, right? So it seems that if I draw a line, okay, where I have varied lambda, okay, so it seems that I have a critical lambda c, okay? So beyond which I had you know, like I had gained some efficient efficiency by resetting, and below which I have not, right? So I can write it in this way. So you can say that okay, this is R star is equal to zero. This is R star greater than zero. Okay. So this is where okay. So can we, can we, as I said, can we say more things, more generic statement, can we give more generic statements such as this for generic stochastic process, okay? That is where now we will come to. Okay, so again, I, I would like to uh, give you two examples, two more examples, okay? Which are, I think, will be, uh, will be quite uh, intuitive for you guys, and also you will be able to understand the entire spectrum we have. So, Sorry? Hmm. So like you, right, so, 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 okay, so let's say like this, it's fine? Yeah, yeah, okay. Okay, so, you see that we have, we have uh, looked into diffusive, diffusive process, we have looked into diff diffusion process, right? Now let us take, just take a look into two different more processes, okay? Very elemental, okay? One is, let's say that you have a, like some sort of a deterministic process, which is going from here to here, okay? Okay, with a constant velocity, okay? So if it's going with a constant velocity, and let's say the distance is L, right? So there is no stochasticity, right? This is a deterministic particle. How long does it take? So it should be L by V, right? So what is the, the distribution of the underlying process in this case? There is no distribution as such, right? So we can just write it in this, in terms of the delta function, right? You agree? This is fine? Okay. Now you have this one, right? So then you can do the Laplace transform, okay? Then I'll put it in this, uh, this renewal formula, right? So if I put it in the renewal formula, what I get is something like this. So TR is equal to <coughs> So this is always greater than T. And actually, you are not surprised by this. So this is a formula, you never mind the formula, right? But what you find essentially is that this, if you add resetting to this process, it is only prolonging the process, right? So you are not really surprised by this because you had a process which was, which was a deterministic process and there was no fluctuation and you were unnecessarily resetting it, right? So it is, it, of course it makes sense, okay? Now let's take final example. So let's just take another example where imagine that the first part, the underlying process itself was nothing but a Poisson process, okay? So, so it, it, usually it will basically stop 
after some exponential times, right? Okay. Is it clear? This is some arbitrary, like I made up a process, which has, which is basically finishing in in this kind of uh, in a random time, which has this distribution, right? I can always do that. Now I want to understand what happens to this. Okay. So I can again use the renewal formula. Okay. Why don't you guys check it now? It will take you like less than 30 seconds. Okay. This is what you have. This is constant. You can even take them one if you want. Okay. Okay, so time over. What is it you got? This one? Sorry? I did I didn't I didn't I didn't hear. Yeah, absolutely. So it, you will see that it remains the same. Okay? So if you have a Poisonian process and you are you are adding resetting on top of that, okay, you cannot distinguish the effect of resetting. Okay. So you see that there is this plenty of different type of processes we looked into and we saw different type of effects of resetting right now I, I think really we are you know exactly at that moment where we can sort of try to proceed to understand the effect of resetting on a general stochastic process okay so what we do is like just assume so if you just remember this plot right so we had something like this and we had something like this right so this was as a function of r, right? So you see that the it seems that the entire game is happening here, right? Because you, you see that what happens to the process when you add a small resetting rate, right? So either the slope change, the slope increases, or it goes down, right? Something like that. Of course, we saw an exception of this Poisson process just now. But other than that, we basically can see this type of effects, right? So if if I can somehow manage to tell you that what is the, you know, like, what decides the slope near r is equal to 0, okay, that should be enough for me to tell whether resetting is going to be useful or not. Of course, you know, like, after go going down, it can again go up. And this, is, this is basically the position where resetting is not useful, right? As you can see that it has already gone beyond the, even the underlying mean first passage time. But the question I am asking is whether resetting is going to be useful or not. Okay, there is a, the answer should be yes or no, and for that it is enough if I look into this process, okay, very close to r is equal to zero, and just look into the slope. Right? Okay. So if I do that, if I want to do that, so I will start with this. So I have this expression. And let's say, let us just lose all these arguments, okay? This. Okay? Just go back to your note and see that you have this expression written somewhere, right? Yeah? Okay. And of course, now what we do? We do a small delta r going to zero expansion, okay? So what is this t tilde r? So t tilde r is e to the power minus so let me just write it on its own. So you, I have e to the power minus r t f t t d t, right? So it, this is, if we do this, so I can expand the e to the power minus r t, right? In the following sense. So I have one minus r t plus r square t square two ta 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 this, right? So if I do this, first term is one, second term is t average, right? Then I have r square t square two, and then it keeps on going. Okay, so this is the expansion of this guy, okay? 
the Taylor series expansion when you have small r, right? Clear? This is t tilde r, this one. Let us even lose this argument. Okay. This was the expression, right? So now I have this expression. Now I'm doing a Taylor series first, right? This is the Taylor series I can do. Now I want to truncate myself in the delta r going to zero limit, okay? I have both numerator and denominator. I will expand both of them, okay? And then I will club all the terms together. And after I do that, I get the following. So I have T to R this. In the first order, I have something like this. Two. And then you have higher order. Okay. And as I said, we are looking into the slope, right? Near the r is equal to 0, right? So I can sort of like within, just imagine that you have all the regularity conditions, etc. So I can truncate my series over here up to linear order, right? Now let's probe this, the following condition. So if the slope, basically, if the mean, mean time, if you introduce the resetting, t resetting rate and it goes up, right? So then what happens? Then your delta t r, this is? OK. So this should be, in this case, what happens? If I, have, if I have added just a small delta r, right? And I see that the mean time has gone up. So then this should be what? This should be greater than, right? In the other case, when I had something like this, right? It's going down. So I should have this, right? And this is the case which I'm interested in. So if I do that, I can just rewrite this expression, take this guy over there, OK? And then what I get is this guy inside the parenthesis, this has to be negative, right? So I should have OK? There, there is, of course, there is a cruci crucial assumption here. You see that I have taken for r is equal to 0, the system is very well defined in the sense that you have all the moments finite, right? At least the first two moments, OK? This is a crucial assumption. So for example, this kind of analysis will not work for simple diffusion, because in simple diffusion, you have mean diverging, right? So you see that whenever you have processes like diffusion, which have uh, like which have power law tails or heavy tails or something which I will get into this broader distribution, okay? There, resetting will always work, okay? Without any doubt. The cases, these are, there are crucial cases, cases like drift and diffusive process, which we studied in the, as a second example. There we saw that by changing the drift, we can actually go from once, one, you know, like one kind of behavior to another kind of behavior, right? This is what we saw. And for these kind of processes, we know the moments are finite. At least the first moment and second moment is finite. So for this kind of process, I can definitely do this kind of uh, linear order analysis, OK? And of course, this kind of linear order analysis can be done for many kind of processes. You have to just probe the fact the first two moments are finite, OK? So now if I rewrite this guy, so I get, I will finally get something like this, OK? So I will get sigma squared t. So let me just maybe write it all. So it's like t squared OK. So I'm, I'm, not, I'm not doing nothing much. Basically, I'm taking this guy over here, just rearranging this, OK? After rearranging, you will get something like this, OK? And this is something, this is a measure of statistical dispersion, which is known in the stochastic process, is something called coefficient of variation, OK? Or something called randomness parameter. Signal to noise ratio, there are many names for this, OK? So this you will get as this, CV square greater than 1, but CV itself is 
positive quantity, so this essentially means that you have CV greater than one. Okay. So these, uh, so the if you have an underlying process, okay. So there are there are many I mean there are many pointers which I think uh, should be noted here. So let's let me just make these comments one by one. So first thing is that what we did we started we had a process right which had a let's say very well defined mean and you know second moment right let's say very well defined and then i wanted to understand the effect of resetting so i added a very small resetting and i wanted to see whether the resetting is going to be useful or not okay and now you see that i don't actually need the entire distribution of the underlying process of course i need it to calculate the exact first mean first passage time that we saw but to understand whether resetting is going to be useful or not you don't really need all the moments what you need is up to linear order you just need the first two moments right so this is one point so you just need these first two moments also note one other thing okay you see the to understand the effect of resetting actually you just need to look into the underlying process itself so even before you add resetting right you will have the information about the uh, about the underlying moments right about the first passage time distribution so let's say that you are looking into your stochastic process right now let's say that you know like you you are very you got very much motivated by this you know like this lecture series and you also under, want to understand the effect of resetting right what is the way you will approach what is the way you should approach if you are looking into any kind of search process so you should look into your underlying process the process which you are looking at currently without resetting and would like to see the distribution of it in particular the first and second moment okay and like to understand should I try to understand how this cv be actually behaves okay if you see the cv is satisfying some sort of condition it seems okay some cv is greater than 1 so you are guaranteed that resetting is going to be useful. Okay. And if you, of course, if you have some, if you have a search process for which you already have a power law tail, etc., etc., there you know, like you don't even need CV condition by default. It will satisfy. Okay. Resetting is always going to be useful. Okay. So, so let me just uh, make a few more comments. So also. This is something, so this CV is equal to 1 is something we call uh, like resetting transition. Okay, so it will be uh, clear in a minute why this, why we call this a resetting transition. You see that we had this, we introduced to this concept, right, that uh, R star is equal to 0 and then R star greater than 0 right so now think about it right what happens when you have let's say i have cv here okay i have the underlying process and i know what is its cv right and now i can vary cv right and now i am looking into i am interested in understanding the optimal rate right so of course you can immediately see in this case right so if you have so let's say that CV is equal to 1 is the boundary, right? So if you have something which is CV less than 1, right? For CV less than 1, you know this is actually the case, right? So R star is always 0, right? So it seems that it is 0, OK? But exactly from CV, as CV becomes greater than 1, so then suddenly R star takes a finite value. So then it goes up like this. Okay, so this is my R star greater than zero. This is R star equals to zero. Okay, so now you can see, right? So you had this question about like, uh, can I keep, can I change the D, right? Keeping lambda fixed. You see, the CV actually is a function of all the system parameters. So this essentially gives you a much more generalized condition. So now, if you just, you have to just probe 
whether CV is greater than one. Now, whatever parameter you would like to vary, you vary, okay, keeping the other fix, okay? So this is the way you can think about, this is something which we call a resetting transition. Look, let me just uh, see uh, how far I can go with this. Okay. Okay, then there, there is this, uh, another comment which I would like to make. So the question is, whether the CV, CV condition is sufficient or not. So the question is whether CV condition is sufficient or not, okay? So what you could have situations, of course. Now you see that the, the situations we saw are like this, right? So you have like this, and you have something like this, right? But also you could have situations like this, right? Somebody was asking me whether, you, I, can, whether I can have multiple minimum, et cetera, and all, right? So I also could have situations like this, where it goes something like that, okay? And then I also could have situation, so let me just, uh, just maybe try to draw it just like a little bit differently, yeah. So let's select. Okay, you have seen similar plots in the morning today. Okay. So now here I am plotting again the mean time as a function of resetting rate. Okay. So you see that in this case, right, the CV was greater than one in this case, so it is, it is guaranteed that it will be use, it will be useful, right? So it is actually a sufficient condition. Okay. In this case, but it is not a necessary condition. Because you could have a CV which is less than one, right? Similar to this one, right? It could go up and then at a later stage it can go down, okay? So again, I'm just trying to probe the delta are going to zero limit, okay? I am I'm not interested what happens actually at the later finite R limits, okay? So, but to understand the effect of resetting and whether to probe the, whether this is a necessary or sufficient condition, we can say that CV condition is actually sufficient to, to know whether resetting is useful or not, okay? But it is not necessary because you could have a situation where CV is initially less than one, but at a later stage, actually the mean, time, mean first passage time went, went down, okay? So resetting was still useful in this case. Right. Yes, yes. So CV condition here, so what I'm saying is that in this case, CV, so that is the reason it's not a necessary condition. If you have CV less than one, yes. CV greater than one, it's guaranteed, right? You, it's, it's sufficient for you, okay? That's it. Okay. And then I think uh, I will finally try to uh, come to this point. So, you know, like I, we have, we have mathematically understood what is the CV criteria, et cetera, and all, right? Now the question is, what does this CV actually mean, okay? Okay. So what is it actually, okay? So what does CV mean, okay? For a given distribution, what does CV mean, right? So you see that, let's say that I'm talking about a distribution underlying first passage, right? This is what anyway CV is coming from. So I have a mean time, right? So now usually we'll have a distribution which is peaked around here, right? Okay, it need not be a sharply peaked, some, something. And this is your fluctuation, right? Now you could have another distribution which is again peaked here, but it could have a larger fluctuation, right? You could have a situation like this, right? With a 
with a higher fluctuation. So what we see that whenever you have an underlying process with a broad distribution, so this is a broad distribution, right? With a larger CV. So this, for this, you have CV, CV higher. And this is where you is, CV is lower. Okay. So whenever you have a very high CV, which essentially means that you have a broader distribution, okay? So in this case, what will happen is resetting will essentially fall here and there, okay? And it will truncate this heavy, heavy tails, okay? Or this whatever making it a broad distribution. And this kind of broad distribution actually arises in many different situations, right? For example, Ludovic is teaching, uh, teaching us all these metastable state, et cetera, et cetera, right? So just imagine that you are doing conducting a search process in a, some sort of a rugged landscape, right? So you have many multiple states, metastable states, something like this. And let's say that this is somewhere you want to reach, right? Let's say this is the final target for you, right? But now you start doing diffusion, and then let's say you are stuck here for a very long time, stuck here for a very long time, right? If you want to calculate the time it takes for you to reach eventually here, right? So this will usually have a broad distribution, right? Because you know the particle essentially takes a lot of time here. It takes a lot of time for the particle to escape from this, right? So usually it will, it will end up in a situation where you have a broader distribution. This is the kind of situation if you artificially do, do resetting mechanism, okay? So you will see that there is always a gain you, you can have. Is it clear? Yeah, so what I was saying that I was trying to, you know, like physically make you understand what does this CV mean, okay? So, so what is the CV, right? You, ha you have a given distribution for the resetting free process, right? So this is basically resetting free process. So it's R is equal to zero, right? And you have a distribution which is peaked around the mean, right? And what is the fluctuation? This is the fluctuation. So you could have a distribution which is sharply peaked around the mean, okay? And then you could have something which is broadly dis distributed around the mean, right? Broadly spread around the mean. So for this case, CV is actually higher, okay? And this is, these are the cases when resetting is going to be useful. And I tried to exemplify this by giving you this kind of search process in a rugged landscape. When you have, let's say, many metastable state and then there is a global minimum where you want to reach. But then you are, spending too much time in these small, small pockets, right? And then it will take time for you to go out of this. So the more time you spend here, right, it adds a lot of time in your first passage time distribution. So it's becoming broader and broader, right? So this kind of, if you use this resetting kind of mechanism, so then what will happen is that probably it will take the, so let's say that this is your initial condition where from you chose your initial distribution, right? The particle, maybe it was uniformly spread over, the entire landscape, right? And then you let the particle diffuse and then it saw the rugged landscape and got stuck here, there, here, and there, okay? So if you don't do any mechanism, so you will see that the time it takes essentially for the particle to reach here will have a broader distribution. This is what you can anticipate. Now, if you keep on doing resetting, which will basically take the particle from here and reset it back to this in initial condition, right? And by doing this, you are, you, are, you can anticipate because you have, will have a higher CV, you can <coughs> anticipate that the resetting is going to be only beneficial. Okay? There can be also other kind of situations. So this is just a 1D picture. You can also have such processes in, let's say, in two dimension, okay? And let's say that you have two different pathways to reach somewhere, okay? So let's say that you have a global minimum somewhere. Imagine now a 2D process, okay? or a 3D process. Now, let's say you have multiple pathways actually to reach there, right? So some paths are useful and some paths are not, right? So you can see that the paths which are actually not useful are giving rise to this very broad distribution, right? This is natural. So if you do resetting again and again, it doesn't matter whether it's an artificial process or not, but if you do this resetting mechanism, you are guaranteed to have some benefits in the search process. Okay, so these are all these CV greater than one condition essentially is, you know, like, is a signature of broad distribution, okay? This is something I think you should keep in mind. This is the take home message 
from this general CV condition. Okay, what does it mean physically? And uh, if you look, if you are now just looking into an arbitrary process, how you should approach before you know, you know, like introduce resetting. First, what is the thing you should look for? Okay, so this is essentially the crux of the matter. Okay, whether resetting is going to be useful or not. Okay, so I will just finalize this story. Uh, again, going back to the uh, going back to this uh, this example of I will take like another ten minutes or so. So we have this right. So now let us try to go back to the the example of diffusion, right? Diffusion and drift, right? Where we saw the transition, correct? And let's try to see what is the CV for these guys, right? All these examples we had, apart from the first case, diffusion case, as I said, it's actually diverging, right? So other case, let's say, uh, first let us look into the, uh, this one, the drift diffusion process, right? So for the Poisson process, right? So for the Poisson process, you can actually show that CV is equal to one, okay? So all the terms essentially disappear. So it remains invariant. Now if you take this deterministic process, right? We had these examples, right? We discussed these examples. So we had something like this, right? So if you do this, you will see that what is the fluctuation for this, for a deterministic process? Zero, right? Yes. So CV square is zero, right? So it's of course, now it is getting obvious, right? So this is one, this is, you know, like, so here CV is less than one, right? Now let's look into this drift diffusion process. And what is CV there? If you calculate CV, okay, you will find something like this. So CV is, uh, CV square actually goes as something called a Peclé number, okay? So, and this Peclé is given by, the x naught by 2D, okay? So it's essentially a, uh, ratio between the diffusive time scale and the drift time scale, okay? So if you have this, so now you can invoke this Peclé condition, uh, the CV condition. So now CV, if CV is greater than one, right? So if CV is greater than one, then what does it become? So this uh, Peclé is less than one, right? And what is Peclé? Peclé is lambda x naught by 2D. So this lambda x naught is less than 2D, okay? So if you go back to the case when I chose 2D is equal to one, right? And then X naught is equal to one, I had this lambda less than one, right? So you remember that I had a plot, right? So then I had something like this, right? So I had something like this. So I had lambda C, and then I said in this case, so it's going to be zero. This is zero, something like that, right? And there I had two plots, and you can explicitly show that this lambda c is equal to one for these given parameters, okay? And now if you see that generically, if you don't really put any numbers here, you see that CV is useful when actually diffusion in the diffusion dominated regime. What does it mean? It essentially means that you had, we had the, what was our search process, right? We had this search process here, zero. So there is no resetting as such, right, here, because we are looking into the underlying process. So I had a drift, of drift. I had a drift over there, and then, of course, I had diffusion itself. So whenever I have this search process, when this diffusion constant actually is higher than the drift parameter, right, which essentially means that the effect of drift is very less in the system. So I am sort of going back to the diffusion re regime, right? This is obviously the case when resetting was useful, okay? But now if this guy starts dominating, so then the system is almost closing the search process by doing a deterministic motion. It, it ha hardly has any effect of D, okay? So it's going back to some sort of deterministic process and you know in this kind of cases, if you add resetting, it's not going to be useful, right? So this is how you can 
try to, you can understand the CV condition in the context of drift diffusion process and these other processes. Okay, so I think uh, I'm good. Uh, if there are questions, I can take, I can take them. Or if you have any other comments, anything, yeah. Okay. Where were you? Like forever going down? Yes. Yes, yes. Right, right, right. Of course, you see in the in this kind of examples, right? All this. Uh, uh, so, if you look into diffusion in an interval, but then you have to add this component of velocity. I mean, if you don't add the component, additional component, you will never get it. I mean, we of course don't understand it physically very well. So, you have. So you get something like this. This is what you are asking, right? You get it for a drift diffusion process with velocity and all. And what happens in this case, I mean, I can just tell you like, so for other cases, it can come something like this, right? So you see that this is, and then it goes up, okay? So here, if you look into this R star, right? So the R star here is finite, but at the, exactly at this point, R star essentially is in both the points, okay? And then it go, it basically, when it goes up there, so R star is now fixed at zero, okay? So if I plot this R star with whatever parameters you are changing, this lambda is not really the, the drift velocity or something, just imagine some parameter here, okay? Let's call it P or something. So then what you will see that you have R star positive, okay? Which is essentially this case, okay? Then at some point of time, you know, like it has basically both the minimum over here at the same position. This is exactly the point. And after that, this local minimum goes up. So R star now is uh, shifted to exactly at zero. So you basically go down something like this. So something like that. I think there are a couple of you know, results along this. But of course, we don't understand this at all uh, like the CV condition. Yes. So, so maybe this is nothing, but when you had the expression for TR average in terms of T tilde, yes, it depends only on T tilde evaluated at R. Correct. Now, T tilde is also the moment generating function of the first passage. Correct. Yes. So is there any understanding, like, is there any sort of intuition in terms of the moment generating function, why it depends at R? That, is, that itself is the moment generating function, right? I mean, yeah, from the Laplace transform, it's clear, but sort of the moment generating function is plotted against this arbitrary parameter, right? So when that parameter is R, is there any specific sort of insight? So let me try to understand what I think. So we had uh, something like this, right? Something like this, right? So this, this, this itself is a moment generating function, right? Now maybe now yeah, maybe so can the moment function. generating function usually it's just a function of some arbitrary parameter and we are interested in derivatives at zero. That's correct. So yes. now suddenly the value of the moment generating function at some non-zero value of this parameter becomes important. So is there Not any sort really of non-zero? Exactly at exactly at R, yeah. and uh, in fact you need all of them, right? You need the entire moment generating function. Yes. So in other words, you need the the full distribution, right? Uh, for the underlying process. Otherwise, you won't be able to get it. Yes. Yeah, sure. Sure. 